So inshallah, today, this afternoon, we're going to be covering uh, Kitab al-Sawm, uh, the chapter on fasting in Nur al-Idah, which is an intermediate text of the Hanafi school of jurisprudence. Uh, this is by Imam Shurun Bulali, who died 1580 of the Common Era. He's an Azhari scholar. Uh, usually this is the second text that's studied in the order. The first text is called the Ascent uh, to Felicity, which is a very basic text, and then you usually study this text and then the Ibn Abidin text as an advanced text. And there's also the Mukhtasar of Al-Quduri, or Ta'lim al haq is usually also studied uh, as an introductory text. I like this text because it goes into a lot of Masail uh, that is pertinent to our situation. It's a little more detailed, and it's laid out nicely. So we're going to get right to it um, with uh, Kitab al We're going to lecture until Asa, and then we're going to take some questions. Um, if there are no more questions after our first initial round, then we'll continue with the text. I'd like to finish the entire chapter, um, so we may actually meet next week at the same time for a couple of hours, just so we can get through the chapter, inshallah ta'ala. So, Fasulun fi kitab is the chapter of fasting. Haqiqat is uh the reality of fasting. So, there's two definitions given of fasting. One is a linguistic, logatan meaning, which is to refrain, or abstentation, or abstinence whether to refrain from speaking or actions or eating or drinking or other things. Um, the definition of fasting in the previous Ummah, like the Bani Israel, is a little bit different. If we notice, we read in the Quran, Maryam alayhi salam, uh, she was ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fast. According to the Quran, she says, I have taken or I have vowed a fast to Ar-Rahman, I will not speak to anyone today. It's interesting because she made this statement after she just ate some dates. So this is a fasting according to the ulama, a fasting from regular household meals and also from speaking. It's a different type of fast, but there is some sort of siyam that was given to the people before us. The shara'an meaning is huwa imsak naharan and idkhali shay'in amadan wa khata'an. Batnan aw malhu hu'kun batin wa an shahwati al-farj bi niyatin min ahlihi. Fasting is to abstain during the day from allowing anything to enter into the stomach through the mouth, nose, or cavity of the body, whether intentionally or by mistake, or that which has the same legal status as the stomach. In addition, fasting is to abstain from sexual gratification along with the intention of fasting. So one must have an intention for fasting. When we fast, we have to have a niyyah. This is fard upon every one of us to make a niyyah. What is a niyyah? A, a intention does not necessarily have to be on the tongue. The seat of the niyyah is in the heart. If you take a vow, right, a nadhar, if you take a vow, then you have to make it orally because the seat of the vow is on the tongue. But a niyyah can be on the tongue, but the best one is in the heart. You just have a firm resolve that you're going to fast. And depending on which fast you're doing, uh, depends on when do you make this niyyah and whether you have to have ta'ayin, what's known as uh, specificity, when you make your niyyah. We'll talk about that uh, inshallah ta'ala. Sababu wujub al the reason which obligates the Ramadan, the fasting of Ramadan. So he says the cause which uh, uh, obligates the fasting of Ramadan is one's presence in that time that it is correct to fast. And the arrival of each day of Ramadan, which is a reason obligating one to fast on that particular day. So continuing, its ruling and its conditions that render it obligatory. So, It is obligatory to perform the current Ramadan as well as making up an unperformed Ramadan, what's known as Qadha, which was missed, provided one meets four conditions. There are four conditions. Al-Islam, wal-Aqal, wal-Bulugh. So if you're Muslim and you're sane, right? You're not insane, you're sane of sound mind, uh, and you're mature, you have baluq, you're an adult. Those are three of the four. The fourth one is an ilm. You have to have knowledge of the fast. Knowledge of the fast as well. So you could be a woman, for example, you're Muslim, you're sane, you're an adult, but you're in your hayd, you're in your menses. Then you are not allowed to fast. Your knowledge tells you, the fourth criteria prevents you from actually fasting. It's impermissible for a woman on her hayd or in nifas if she has postnatal bleeding, uh, to fast. Okay? So he says here something interesting. 
and this is somewhat obsolete, uh, if someone becomes Muslim in Darul Harb, and these are kind of pre-modern divisions, right, where, you know, in the pre-modern world, basically, your religious identity was identical uh, with your political affiliation. Today, that's not the case with the rise of the nation state and so on and so forth. But let's say somebody, hypothetically, someone becomes Muslim in a country that is at war with the Muslims. Actively, Muslims are being killed and so on and so forth in that country. If this person is Muslim and he's an adult and he's sane and he doesn't have recourse to any other Muslim, then he doesn't need to fast. Uh, but if two upright Muslims meet him, uh, and tell him about the obligations that he has to fast, although the two companions, and when we say two companions, according to this text, we're talking about the two companions, the Shaykhain of Imam Abu Hanifa. So these are Qadi Abu Yusuf ibn Ibrahim and Shaykh Muhammad al-Shaybani. These are really the codifiers of the Hanafi school. And these two men said that this person, even if he meets two Muslims that are not uh, upright, they're facet, um, that it necessitates fasting for that person in Darul Harb, where this is again Darul Harb, these are kind of obsolete type of, um, most ulama would say that it's not black and white like this anymore. However, for our purposes, if you're, in, if you're Muslim, you're sane, and you're mature, uh, you're expected to have knowledge of the fast, so you can't plead ignorance. Shurut um, wujubi adaisom, conditions that obligate one to fast Ramadan. The conditions that make it obligatory to fast are to be free from ill health, a sihatu min marad, you don't have a disease, you're not sick, and you're free from hayd, from menstrual periods, which lasts from three to ten days, the uh, average is five. You're free from nifas, postnatal bleeding, which the minimum, there's no minimum, but the maximum is 40 days. And, and you're a resident. If you're traveling, fasting is not compulsory, though if it is achievable, then it is better to undertake its performance and more on traveling later. The conditions that validate the fast of Ramadan are three. You have a niyyah, an intention, and again, you are free from menstrual bleeding, postnatal bleeding, and everything that breaks the fast. This is so, sort of introduction he's going through right now. Uh, it is not a condition to be free from sexual discharge. This may not be a, a good, uh, maybe I should ask the children to leave. Maybe I won't cover this. I mean, this is really important things. And maybe if the children uh, could be dismissed, that would be probably best. Because people ask these questions all the time. And if there are children in the room, they probably will be hesitant to address these issues. So is that okay if we can ask this? <laughs> Sorry. Maybe if the parents can take notes. Now you have, now you have to take notes. Okay. Um, so you can share with your children, inshallah. <clears throat> um, so, it is not a condition to be free from, free from sexual discharge. That This means that a person may have had an unconscious discharge while sleeping, like nocturnal emission. Or one may have had intercourse prior to dawn and did not remove the filth after the dawn. This discharge that remains on the body or clothes until after the dawn arrives, did not affect the fast. So there's hadith in Abu Dawood from Aisha, the Prophet wasallam. He would partake of the suhoor, which is mustahab. We'll talk about these legal definitions in a minute. He would partake of the suhoor, then he would visit his wife, and then he would go to sleep, and the adhan of fajr would wake him up. So he's waking up in a state of greater ritual impurity, right? He's in a state of janaba. But this does not cancel the fast. He would simply wake up, make ghusl, and continue the fast. He does not have to make qada. He does not have to uh, make up the fast. Okay. Likewise, if you take a qaylula, which is like a you know early afternoon nap, which is advisable to do, especially during this Ramadan, there's very long days, and let's say you sleep, and then you have an emission, you have a bad dream or something like that, you have an emission in your sleep, uh, your fast is not broken because you did not touch yourself and no one else touched you. Uh, it was simply an, uh, an emission that came in your sleep. Therefore, you simply wake up and you make ghusl and continue your fasting without qada. Okay? Ruknus som, the pillar of fasting. The pillar of fasting is to abstain 
from the desire for food, intercourse, and that which has the same legal status of both, such as medicine entering the body through a deep cut. Uh, okay, now we go to Aqsam al different types of fasting. وَبَيَانُ كُلِّ قِسْمٍ يَنْقَسِمُ الصَّوْمْ إِلَى سِتَّةِ أَقْسَامٍ There are six types of fasting, and we have to really know these six types of fasting. So I encourage people to take notes. Maybe if you're not taking notes, you're a genius. I have to take notes. So we have to be familiar with these legal designations or rulings. Okay, The first type of fast is called farud. Farud. What does farud mean? Obligatory, compulsory, incumbent upon every Muslim. Farud. Okay? What does that mean from a shara'an standpoint? It's something that is farud is established through dalil qat'i. It's mentioned in the Quran explicitly or mentioned in numerous hadith and has the status of a mutawatur hadith. Okay? So someone who performs a farud action is rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Someone who does not perform a fard is punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Someone who rejects a fard is a kafir. Rejection of a fard is kufr. Okay? Wajib now. That's the first type of fast. We'll talk about what these fasts are. But now we have a different category. A different legal ruling or designation known as wajib. What is the difference between fard and wajib? For the Hanafis there's a difference. Initially, it's the same. If you perform something that's wajib, you're rewarded. If you don't do it, you're punished. If you reject a wajib, it is not kufr, it is fisq. You have not left the religion, you have committed a sin. Why? What's the difference? It's because something that is fard is established through dalil qat'i, explicit text, uh, or multiply attested text, where something that is wajib is established through khabar ahad. A, a single or solitary transmission. Okay? For example, somebody says, uh, I, I'm not going to pray Salat al Dhuhr. I don't believe it's far. I reject it. Such person is not Muslim. He is a kafir. But if somebody says, I don't pray witr, and we're talking about the Hanafi school. In the Hanafi school, witr is wajib, not in the Shafi'i school. From a Hanafi perspective, somebody says, I don't believe in witr, then he's a fasiq. It's not kufr, because witr is wajib, it's not fard. Okay, so to keep that in mind. The third type of fast, we have fard and wajib. Now we have sunnah or masnoon, a sunnah fast. Sunnah mu'akkada, emphasized sunnah. Emphasized sunnah for the ahnaf, for the Hanafis, is that if you do it, something that is sunnah mu'akkada, if you do it, you're rewarded. If you don't do it, you're not punished, but it's blameworthy. And if you continuously leave sunnah, it does become sinful. Let's repeat it. If you do something sunnah, it's rewarded. If you leave it, it's not sinful, but it is blameworthy. You're going to be reprimanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is a form of punishment anyway. But over time, it does become sinful if you consistently leave sunnah mu'akkada, emphasize sunnah. The fourth legal designation is called mandub, mandub, which is translated recommended. You can call this mustahab also. Mandu or mustahab. This is totally extra credit. If you do it, you're rewarded. If you don't do it, la bas alayk. Nothing wrong. No problem. Extra credit. Mandu or mustahab. And then you have nafila. This is the fifth. Nafila is like mustahab. Extra credit. If you do it, that's great. Extra credit. If not, no problem. Okay? The sixth category is called makruh. Makruh means disliked, and there's two types of makruh. There's makruh tanzihan, makruh tanzihan, which means slightly disliked. This is the opposite of sunnah mu'akkada, the opposite of sunnah mu'akkada. Something that is makruh tanzihan, it's prohibited, it's a mild prohibition. If you do it, you're not punished. If you refrain, if you refrain then you're rewarded, right? But if you do it, there is it's blameworthy. It's just the opposite of sunnah mu'akkada. And one who continuously does something that is makrut and zihan could lead to sin. Just like sunnah mu'akkada, the opposite though. The second type of sunnah is called sunnah tahriman. Makru, I'm sorry. Uh, makru tahriman. Makru tahriman is prohibitively disliked. Prohibitively disliked. The opposite of this is wajib. The opposite of 
Makruh tahrima is wajib, meaning there's a prohibition. If you engage in it, it's sinful. If you refrain, you're rewarded. If you reject it, then you're a fasik. If you reject the prohibition, then you're a fasik. Just like the opposite of wajib. If you reject a wajib, you're not kafir, you're a fasik. Those are the six categories of fast. And some of the ulama say that makru tahrima uh, is some of the fasts, the days of fasting. Ta'lim uh, al for example, it says that this category is basically haram. So sometimes you'll find makru tahrima equated with haram. But again, the difference from the Hanafi is something is haram through dalil qat'i. Okay? So the, different, the, 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 the opposite of haram then is what? Fard. Fard, when dealing with fasting. The opposite of haram is fard. Uh, so, uh, if you do something that's haram, you're punished, right? If you refrain from it, you're rewarded. If you reject a haram, if you say, for example, there's nothing wrong with drinking alcohol, then this is kufur. Okay? Any questions about that? About these legal rulings? The first three? Okay, we said uh, sunnah. This is for fasting. Uh, so, oh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, fard. We said fard. So fard, we said that if you do something that's fard, it's rewardable. If you refrain from fard, you're punished. Okay? If you reject a fard, reject, not neglect. If you neglect a fard, <coughs> then this is fisk. You neglect it. But if you reject it, then you've entered into kufur. The opposite of haram. The second was wajib. The only difference between fard and wajib is that wajib is not established with a dalil qat'i. There's not a firm, definitive text. Okay? Therefore, rejection of a wajib is not kufur. It's fisk. The example we used is salatul dhuhr versus salatul witr. Rejection of salatul dhuhr you say, I don't pray dhuhr. I don't believe in salat al-dhuhr. The other four I'll pray. Or if you say, I don't believe in any prayer. I don't believe in any of the prayers. This is kufr. If you're lazy and say, I just don't want to pray because I'm lazy, then you're neglecting them. You're not rejecting them. So you're still a Muslim. Although Ahmad ibn Hanbal said, no, you're kafir. <laughs> but that's a minority opinion. Right? Something is wajib, like witr, according to the Hanafi. You say, I don't pray witr. Right? Then you've entered into fisk. This is not kufr. Because it's wajib. And the third one was sunnah. Sunnah. Sunnah mu'akkada. According to the Hanafis, emphasized sunnah. If you do something that is sunnah, you're rewarded. If you, if you don't do it, it's not sinful unless it's done over and over again. Leaving a sunnah over and over and over again is sinful. But it is blameworthy to leave a sunnah. The opposite of sunnah mu'akkada was makru tanzihan. The opposite of wajib is makru tahriman. The opposite of fard is haram. Okay? Sunnah mu'akkada, yeah. For example, there's, uh, there's two sunnah before the salat al-fajr, before the fard of fajr. Right? Those are sunnah mu'akkada, meaning the Prophet sallallahu he would do those consistently, consistently, consistently. Right? Uh, the four before Dhuhr, four Raqqa before Salat al Dhuhr, Sunnah Mu'akkada. Yeah, so there's a difference of opinion amongst the Madahib, which are Sunnah Mu'akkada and Ghir Mu'akkada. There's four Sunnah before Asr that for the Hanafis is Ghir Mu'akkada. That means if you don't do them, no problem whatsoever. It's like Nafila. Right? But two before Fajr, four before Dhuhr, two after Dhuhr, nothing for Asr, two after Maghrib. Uh, two after Isha, there's also four before Isha, that's Ghar Mu'akkada, and then Witr, which is Wajib. Also, Tarawih is Sunnah Mu'akkada. Tarawih, 20 Raka'ah, according to the Hanafi school, is Sunnatun Mu'akkada. Okay? Sunnah Mu'akkada on every Muslim. It's Sunnah Kifaya to pray Tarawih in the Masjid. Okay? Uh, if you pray, if there's a congregation happening in the Masjid, you have a choice whether you want to pray in the masjid or at home. Praying in the masjid is mustahab. It's al-afdal. It's better to pray in the masjid. 
But as long as you're doing your tarawih, either at home or at the masjid. If there's no tarawih in the masjid, the entire community is blameworthy. Okay? So, obviously, mashallah, here there's going to be tarawih prayer. So you have a choice. You can come to the masjid or you can do it at home, whether you're man or woman. Although, uh, praying in the masjid is always better. So there's no reprimand. You can't go to a brother and say, why don't you come to the masjid? You're, you're a fasik. No, he can pray at home if he wants to. Okay, because it's a sunnah upon every Muslim, but praying in the masjid is mustahab. It's optional, but it's better too. Okay. Oh, it's not going to Could you please write down? Oh, really? <laughs> can I write it for you? Okay, inshallah. Maybe uh, Brother Masood can write and I can speak. There's, there's a lot to cover. Um, Just the, the sunnah, the, the six guys, the reward and the right. Okay. He'll, he'll do it, inshallah. Is this going to be posted? Some, yes, this, 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 uh, this website, yes. On the website, okay. So if you probably go back, because I want to get through as much material as I can, inshallah. <laughs> now let's talk about these, these six guys. Yes? Due to lack of time, we will have the question and session later on. Let him oh. go through uh, this thing. Oh. So, no questions, please. We'll, 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 um, yeah, we'll do the questions after okay. Oscar. Can we bring the kids back? Or yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you can bring them back for now. <laughs> There's going to be other times, though, for it. Okay, so, he's a man of God, 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 he's As for the obligatory fast, there's three types of fasts that are followed. Three fasts, three that are followed. They are the fast of the current Ramadan or missed days from a previous Ramadan. These are called Qadha. It's fault for you to fast those. The second type or expiation fast, Kafara. Okay, so if you, for example, if you broke your fast intentionally, willfully, uh, you have to do Kafara. There's certain ways of expiating a fast that you broke. One of the ways of doing it is fasting 60 consecutive days. They have to be in a row. If you get to day 59 and you break your fast, you have to start over again. And there's other ways to do kafara. We'll talk about that. So expiation fasts are fard. The third type is called nadr or nidr. This is a vow, a, an oath that one makes to fast. Uh, and this is considered fard by Abu Hanifa because of the verse in the Quran. Let them abide by their vows. Surah Al-Hajj, ayah number 29. So, for example, you say, uh, I vow to Allah, I'm going to fast this Wednesday. You take a vow to Allah. And the vow is done on the tongue. The seat of the nadr is done on the tongue. If you do that, then it is followed upon you to fast on that day. Okay? <clears throat> so, let's talk a little bit about breaking a fast and then we'll go more into detail into this because a lot of questions are related to this. Let's say that you're fasting Ramadan and you're making wudu. You're rinsing out your mouth and the swallow reflex takes over and you swallow water. What happens here? You have to, in this case, you have to make qada, which means what? You make up that one day. You cannot continue to eat. You can't say, all I ate, I drank, let's continue to eat. It is wajib for you to not eat after you, after you accidentally broke your fast. You cannot eat. It is makrut. Okay? So you simply make qada. Why? Because it was khata'an. It was an accident. You drank or ate accidentally. Right? Now let's say that you're, um, you're uh, fasting Ramadan and you forgot you were fasting. You forgot. So you go to um, Shalimar and you get some roti and boti and you eat it. And you, eat the, you eat the whole thing. And then after you're done, you say, Ah, oh, Allah, I was fasting. Right? Nasiyan. You forgot though. If you forgot, no qada. You don't have to make it up. You forgot, Allah fed you. Just say, Alhamdulillah. You don't induce vomit. No. You ate it, khalas. Okay? Because you forgot. You totally forgot. 
Now, let's say that you willfully, intentionally, you willfully and intentionally broke your fast. Now you have to make qada of that day and also expiate. You make qada of that day and you have to do the kafara. One option is 60 consecutive days. Don't break your fast intentionally. Just don't do it. Okay? So these are the three types of fasts that are fought. They are the Som of Ramadan and any days that were missed in the past, as well as expiation fasts, right? As well as a nazar mu'ayyan, a fast that you vowed to make. These are the three types, three types of fault fast. As for the wajib, he says, This is something interesting in the Hanafi school. A wajib fast is a nafila fast, or a sunnah fast, or a mandub fast, that you intentionally broke, now you have to make it up. So, for example, the Prophet ﷺ sometimes would fast on Mondays and Thursdays. This is considered mandub, right? This is mustahab to do that. Let's say that you, on one of these Mondays, you said, I'm going to fast. So you begin fasting. And then you broke your fast because you were at work and somebody brought in a, a tres leches cake. So oh, I, need some, I need some cake. So you broke your mandub fast, right? In this situation, it is now wajib for you to make up that fast, even though it was a nafila fast. Okay, this is based on the text in the Quran. Uh, this is the proof text Abu Hanifa used and his students. Do not cancel your, your good deeds. Do not cancel your actions. So even though you started the fast, total optional, right? Nafila fast, mandub or even sunnah fast. If you spoil that fast, it's wajib upon you now to go back and make qada of that fast. Wajib. Okay? <coughs> this is not so for the shafiris. If you break a nafila fast, khalas, if broken, you don't have to make it up. As for a sunnah fast, sunnah, it is the day of Ashura. What is Ashura? The 10th of Muharram. The 10th of Muharram, this is a sunnah fast, but he says also the 9th of Muharram. It's actually makruh to isolate Yom Ashura only. Makruh. Either you do Yom Ashura and the 9th together, or Yom Ashura and the, and the 11th. You have to connect it with either the day before or the day after. Okay? Also, a sunnah fast is the 9th of Dhul Hijjah. The 9th of Dhul Hijjah, which is just before uh, Eid al Adha, the 10th of Dhul Hijjah. Okay? The 9th of Dhul Hijjah is also a uh, sunnah fast. It is mandub, it is mustahab, it is desirable, extra credit, to fast three days of every month. Three days of every month. And then he gives the desirable of the desirable. If you're going to fast these three days, it's better to do ayamul bid. Ayamul bid, which are the white days, literally the white days. The 13th, 14th, and 15th days of the month. This is a mandub or mustahab fast. The 13th, 14th, and 15th days of the month. There's a hadith in Abu Dawood, the Prophet ﷺ would order us to fast the three white days. He said, this is like keeping somud dahar, perpetual fast. If you do these three white days, it is as if you're fasting every day, which by the way is makruh to do anyway. But he's giving an example. The reward is equivalent to like you're fasting every day. Okay? Ayyamu bil. Was someone if name al khamis? It is recommended to fast on Mondays and Thursdays of every week. The Prophet said the works of the servants are presented to Allah on Monday and Thursday. This hadith in Tirmidhi. So I like that my works are presented while I am fasting. Okay? So, Yom al Ithnain, Wal Khamis, Mondays and Thursdays, is a mustahab, mandub, totally optional, fast with great blessing in it. Wasomu sitta min shawal, 
ثم قيل الأفضل وصلها وقيل تفريقها It is recommended to fast six days of the month of Shawwal. What is Shawwal? The month after Ramadan. Okay, the month after Ramadan. So this is the tenth month. It has been said that these six days are to be fasted consecutively. Though it has also been said that the six days can be fasted intermittently, meaning not consecutively. And there's hadith regarding this as well. What's interesting here, uh, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the commentator mentions Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala multiplies good deeds by 10. So 30 days of Ramadan, 30 times 10 is 300. And then six days of Shawwal times 10 is 60, 360. So it's like you fast the entire day, the entire year, I'm sorry. Okay, there is a difference of opinion amongst the jurists whether fasting six days successively, immediately after Eid al-Fitr is superior to fasting six days randomly throughout the month of Shawwal. Imam Shafi'i, Imam Ahmad, and Abu Dawood hold that the, hold the view as six consecutive days is better. So right after Eid al-Fitr, do not fast on Eid. This is makru tahriman. Some would say haram to fast on Eid. Do not fast on Eid, prohibited. But right after Eid, on the second of Shawwal, you fast six consecutive days, or you can fast six days throughout the month, but according to the majority, it's better to do them immediately. The whole city of Tarim, when I was in Yemen, the entire city, everybody fast immediately after Eid al-Fitr, six days. This is what the Ba'alawi do in, in Tarim. Depends on the locale. The Shafi'is in Tarim, that's what they do. Okay? It's also recommended the fast of Dawood. كان يصوم يوما ويفطر يوما وهو أفضل الصيام وحبه إلى الله تعالى. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said the best fast is the fast of Dawood عليه السلام. He would alternate fast one day and not fast, fast one day and not fast. This is also مستحب مندوب. <coughs> As for the نافلة fast, it is anything that was not mentioned before, as long as that day is not. A day that is makru to fast. Okay, so let's say you want to fast on a random Tuesday. Okay, as long you know it's not from the ayam ubid, it's not yomi ashura, right? It's not a Monday or a Thursday. Obviously, you want to fast on that Tuesday. It's nafila, unless that Tuesday falls on a day that is makru to fast. There are certain days that it's impermissible. Remember, we said there's two types of makru. Makru tanzihan and makru tahriman. There's slightly disliked and then there's prohibitively disliked. The first type, al awwal sumwa ashura munfaridan, anid tasir. So it's makru tanzihan to single out yomi ashura and fast only on that day. Remember, you have to connect it with the 9th or the 11th as well. And this is to differentiate the Muslims from the Bani Israel. <coughs> والثاني صوم العيدين وأيام التشريق. It's مكرو تحريما. Some books say حرام. To fast on any of the two Eids, Eid al-Fitr, Eid al-Adha, it is مكرو تحريما. As well as the أيام التشريق. What are the أيام التشريق? That yes, three days after Eid al-Adha, the eleventh, the twelfth, and the thirteenth of Dhu al-Hijjah. He's called Ayamu Tashriq, Makru Tahriman. So Eid is the first of Shawwal, right? Uh, and Eid al Adha is the tenth of Dhul Hijjah. And then the three days that follow are called Ayamu Tashriq. It is Makru Tahriman to fast on these days. Five days of the year we do not fast. It is also Makru uh, to single out Friday by itself, unless you do Thursday and Friday, or Friday and Saturday. Unless Friday, again, is one of the first, one of the first six days of Shawwal, or Ayam Ubiid, right, or one of those days. But singling out Friday by itself is Makru. Also singling out Ifradu Yom Sabt, singling out Saturday as well, unless you do Friday and Saturday, or Saturday and Sunday. And if Saturday should fall on Ayam al for example, then that's fine. It's not Makru. Well, Yomi Nawruz. 
It is dislike to fast on an Eid that the Persians celebrate. No rules, right? Um, now, this is under the assumption that you're fasting for Allah. It just happens to be Yom, yom Noruz. But if you're fasting for the sake of Yom Noruz, then this is Kufur. Okay? So, like, uh, you're, you're, you, somebody wants to fast on Christmas, right? They say, I'm going to make a Nafila fast for Allah. It happens to fall on Christmas. It's better not to do that. It's makru. But if you fast for the sake of Christmas, this becomes Kufur. I'm going to fast on Easter because I'm a perennialist now. It's in, it's in vogue now. Fast on Easter. Right? Don't want to do that. Try to avoid it. Obviously, many of the days are pagan holidays and we just don't know it. So that's fine if you don't know pagan holidays. But if you should know this is a pagan holiday, right? then don't fast on that day. Fast on a different day. Also, makru is somul wisal, which is uninterrupted fasting day and night. Right? So the Prophet ﷺ, he would do this sometimes. Fast during the day, would not eat at night. Fast the next day, would not eat at night. This is makruh even for two days. And the Sahaba said, well, that's what you do, because some of them tried to do it. Right? They, they did that for two or three days. And the Prophet ﷺ, he says in the hadith in Bukhari, that my constitution is different than you. My Lord gives me to eat and drink in the night. He satiates me in the night. This is not for you. This is from the khususiyat the special unique qualities of the Prophet Sallallahu just like praying to Hajjid for him is wajib, not for anybody else. He had more than four wives, nobody else. No one can marry his wives after him. They are our mothers, right? No one can marry them. No one uh, from his family, household, his descendants can take zakah or sadaqa. Ahlul Bayt do not take that. So these are from the uh, khususiyat. He had the strength of 70 men, right? So we don't do this. So when we saw is makru for us to do. We don't do that. It puts us in danger. The Prophet ﷺ is different in that regard. That's his special prerogative. <coughs> it is disliked to fast what's known, what's known as sawm al for one's entire life. Every day you're fasting. This is makru. And the reason is because it defeats the purpose after a while. The purpose of fasting is to have jihad against the shakwat and the nafs. But when you become accustomed to that, there's no more struggle. That just becomes part of your adat. So it's defeating the purpose. That's why the best fast is the fast of Dawood. Because you never get accustomed to that. Right? It's a constant struggle. Every day is a struggle. Every fast day is a struggle. Okay, now he's talking here about intention. Okay? So there's certain fasts in which your intention can be general, okay? And you have a large span of time in which to make your intention. One of these fasts is the fast of Ramadan. So in the fast, the, the month of Ramadan, we have to make an intention. Um, and it can be general. In other words, if it's, if, if it's the night of the 13th of Ramadan, you can simply have a firm, resolve, a firm resolve in your heart that you're going to fast the next day. Remember, you don't have to uh, say it on the tongue. You don't have to articulate your niyyah. You have a firm resolve in your heart. And you don't have to have ta'yin. You don't have to say, okay, I'm fasting tomorrow for the 13th of Ramadan. You don't have to have that type of specificity. Okay? And you actually have until just before the zawal on the next day to make your intention. Okay? What is the zawal? The meridian of the sun, the highest peak of the sun, the zenith of the sun. When the sun starts to go down, that's the beginning of dhuhr. So we're talking about before the zawal. That's when the time for your intention ends. Okay? Uh, also, obviously, given the fact that you're not eating. Okay? So you have that time to do the intention. Um, <clears throat> Uh, let's see. Also, a fast that is a fast that one vows to make on a specific day also does not require specificity. It's ta'yin. Just a general type of uh, intention, a firm resolve in the heart and you have until just before zawal on the next day. Obviously, if you've eaten breakfast, then you can't fast on that day. You can't choose that day to fulfill your vow. 
What nafila? Also nafila fasts. Right? The intention can be general and you have until zawal, before zawal on the next day. So, Somu Ramadan, Wan Nadru Mu'ayyan, and Nafila Fas, which includes Sunnah, Mandub, your intention can be general and you have until just before zawal on the next day to make your intention. The proof of this is a hadith in Muslim, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, during the day, early morning, when the sun was already well up, uh, he looked around the house for something to eat. He didn't find anything. So he goes to Aisha and he says, is there anything to eat? And she says, no. And he says, okay, I'm fasting. <laughs> this was before the Zawal. Okay. So, okay, let's see. We have to sort of skip around here. We're running out of time. Okay, so the fasting that requires one to be specific and to make it at night is what? Is Qadau Ramadan. Let's say you're making up a day that you were sick last year from the previous Ramadan. Okay, if you're going to make up that day, you have to be specific in your intention and it has to be done before Fajr, before Tulu al Fajr. You don't have until the uh, z- uh, Zawal. And you have to be specific. In other words, you have to think about it in your heart, or you can even articulate it, or make a note of it, that I'm fasting this day because of such and such a day that I missed last year. Right? There has to be ta'yin, you have to be specific. Also, making up a ruined voluntary fast. Remember we talked about you're going to fast on a random uh, Tuesday, and then you saw the tres leches cake, and you said, I guess I'll just eat. Now it's wajib to make up that fast. But when you do make it up, you have to have ta'yin. You have to be specific in your intention, and it can only be done at night before Fajr. Also, uh, kafara, if you should have to expiate, those have to have ta'yin, you must be specific as well. And the last type in which you need to have ta'yin is if you vow a fast in a general way. Let's say that you say something like, Oh Allah, if you cure my cancer, I'll fast a day for you. Okay? And then your cancer is cured. You can pick a day to fast. But when you pick that day, you have to be specific in your intention. This is to fulfill my vow that I made on such and such a time. And this intention is done before Fajr. Okay? That has a section in here on sighting the moon. I don't know if you guys want to go into that. No? Yes or no? no. Really? Yeah. What should we do? Yeah? Let's do it. Okay, so establishing the moon of Ramadan. Uh, the Hilal. Yathbutu Ramadan bi ru'yati hilalihi. Aw ba'da sha'ban thalath. Ramadan is established when the moon is sighted. So, it's established when the moon is sighted. So, not calculated. It must be sighted. The ru'yati hilal is sighted. Now, there's something we can do with technology here, right? Obviously, we can uh, establish that the moon was sighted with technology. But determining the month of Ramadan without actually sighting the moon, this is against the sunnah. Some would call it a bid'ah. Um, but majority will say that it's permissible to do it like that as well. Um, so he says here that if the moon is obstructed, uh, if the moon is obstructed, and it's the 29th night of Sha'aban, and no one sees the moon, then you simply reckon Sha'aban as 30 days. That's all you have to do. Very simple answer. You reckon it as 30 days because a lunar month is either 29 or 30 days. Now he talks about Yom Shak, the day of doubt. What is the day of doubt? The day of doubt is what comes after the 29th day of Sha'aban. Okay? So, what is the 29th day of Sha'aban? Is Monday. Right? So, Tuesday, this Tuesday, is either the 30th of Sha'aban or the 1st of Ramadan. Right? That's why it's called Yom Shak, because it's uncertain. What day is it? Okay? So he mentions here, it is disliked to fast 
This day, accept a voluntary fast that one is firm about with no wavering between it and other fasts. The day of doubt is not to be performed as a fast on the belief that it is Ramadan. Rather, it is observed as a voluntary fast. So it's impermissible for you to say on Monday night, if tomorrow is Ramadan, I'll fast. If not, I won't fast. And you don't strengthen your intention before the Zawad. Okay? So before the, before the Zawad, before the, uh, the meridian, you have to make a decision. Or are you going to fast Ramadan or is it Nafila? Okay? The best thing to do here is to make an intention for Nafila. Right? On Monday night, say, I'm going to make an intention for Nafila fast tomorrow. Okay? And uh, if it's Ramadan, then your Nafila is converted and that's fine. Your Nafila intention suffices Ramadan for Yom Mushak. But remember, if you make an intention for Nafila and tomorrow is not Ramadan and you break your fast after you made an intention, then you have to make Qadha of that as wajib upon you. Or what you can do is just simply delay your intention until just before Dhuhr, do some investigating and see if the moon was sighted. Without eating, of course, before that. This is usually not a problem nowadays because we use technology in the sense that we can contact Muslim communities across oceans, right? So we don't have to wait until Yom Mushak. We know the night before whether the moon was sighted anywhere in the world. Right? So Yom Mushak is sort of obsolete for our purposes. If one is hesitant upon the day of doubt when fasting and breaking fast, for example, if he says, if it is Ramadan, then fasting. If it's not, I'm not fasting. He is not considered to be fasting because he was not decisive in his intention. If it later appeared that it is Ramadan, he is required to make up that day, even if he did not eat. So on Monday night you say, if tomorrow is Ramadan, I'll fast. If not, I'm not going to fast. And you did not even eat. And it's after Zawal. And you figure, so it's now past the time of your firm intention. And then you find out it is Ramadan. You have to make up that day, even though you didn't eat because you weren't, you didn't have thabat in your niyyah, right? You weren't decisive in your intention. Usually what happens in the Muslim world is that the mufti, right, or the imam or the qadi, uh, he would do the investigation on the yom shak right? So he'd get up in the morning, He'd try to find reports, was the moon sighted? So everyone has sort of held off of their intention. And then before Dhuhr, he has to make an announcement. Is it Ramadan or not? So no one's eaten anything. They're just waiting for the announcement. If he says, yes, today's Ramadan, continue your fasting. Make your intention for Ramadan and continue fasting. He says, no, today is the last day of Sha'ban. It's the 30th of Sha'ban. Uh, if you made an intention for Nafila, you have to keep fasting. If you did not, you can eat, no problem. Okay. Yeah, I think this stuff is a little... Um, maybe we'll skip over some of this stuff. But basically, who can sight the moon? And this really applies to us. Um, who, who has the authority to sight the moon? If there's no obstruction, right? And this, this is what applies to us. Because again, we sort of live in a global village and we can get information from different Muslim communities all around the world, which pre-modern people did not do. So according to the Hanafi school, Al-Jam'u Al-Azim can sight the moon. It has to be 50 people or more. Okay, this is the opinion of the Hanafi school. And there's another opinion that Al-Jam'u Al-Azim is sort of open to the discretion or the definition of the Imam of the Masjid, but it's usually 25, 30, 50 or more people have to sight the moon in order for it to be accepted um, that it's Ramadan when there's no obst obstruction. If there's an obstruction, then one person can sight it. But no obstruction, al jam al So, uh, it's not like there's one guy in Jamaica with his telescope who sights the moon and then he goes on Facebook and he has a thousand friends on Facebook and all of them say, the moon's been sighted, the moon's been sighted. Right? And you say, oh look, this is Jamul al no, it comes down to one guy in Jamaica with his telescope, right? So this usually will not be accepted by the ulama. So usually it's a Muslim community or a Muslim organization that will cite the moon. Uh, also for the Eid, 
Eid al-Fitr or al-Adha, it must be a large group to sight the moon if there's no obstruction. Al-Jam al Azim. And then he goes on to, maybe I'll just mention one more thing here. <clears throat> if you see the moon by yourself, you see it by yourself, you go to the Qadi and he rejects it, the, the moon for Ramadan. He says, no, you're, you're wrong. I don't accept your, maybe, I would be not your fasik. And he says, no, you know, you're that guy who said this and that. I'm not going to accept. You have to fast on your own. If you saw the moon, you have to fast on your own. But let's say that you saw the moon for Eid. Eid al-Fitr. Okay? So you go to the Qadi and he rejects it. You have to fast also. You cannot break your fast. Because now the community is involved. You can't have your own little private Eid celebration. Because I saw the moon by myself. Even if you saw the moon, you truly saw it, you, you have to fast on that day. Because now the community is involved. Okay? So he goes into a lot of detail regarding that stuff. But I want to get to actually this part right here. That which does not nullify the fast. Okay? Um, so, eating, drinking, intercourse, forgetfully, right, nasian, does not break the fast. We talked about that. If any of you, the Prophet said, if, if any of you forgetfully eats or drinks, he should complete his fasting, for Allah has fed him and given him to drink. So complete the fasting, right? It's watch him to continue fasting, right? So even if you're halfway through a burger and you have it in your mouth, and you realize I'm fasting, get everything out of your mouth immediately. We can't say, well, now I'm done. Because then you have to make qadha. Right? You don't want to make qadha. Right? Maybe you do, I don't know. But if it's totally forgetful, then halas. You don't have to make it up. If one has the ability to fast, yet he forgetfully eats and drinks, then he is to be reminded by onlookers, and failure to remind him is disliked. So you have to sort of uh, tread lightly here, right? People are very sensitive. But if, for example, you're walking down the street, you see a Muslim brother that you know, and he's having soup and salad on the on the on the, on the, at the cafe over there, we gently come and remind him. Oh, did you know it's Ramadan? You know, if you don't do that, then it's makru, right? Uh, and if he reacts badly to you, then halas. As long as you had uh, a spirit of um, kindness towards that person, then that's his that's his problem. Um, however, he says, if it's a person who's poverty-stricken, then you do not remind him. If it's a real homeless, poverty-stricken Muslim man who just found some food and says, hey man, it's Ramadan, what are you doing? Then actually it's going to actually have a detrimental effect. Um, he might actually become renegade against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and so you have to use your judgment, but this is a very rare case, especially in this context that we're living in. But if you see a Muslim, he's identified a Muslim, uh, you know he's not traveling, you know, Oh, that's a brother, he's my next door neighbor, and he's having lunch. And he appears to be fine, he's not sick or anything. Then you should try to remind people that it's Ramadan. Oh, this next part. Well, I guess we'll skip this part because there's children here. Um, applying oil to the body does not break the fast. Likewise, the application of kohol or eyeliner does not break the fast, even if the taste appears in the throat. Aisha anha, relates that the Prophet وسلم, applied kohol while he was fasting. Ibn Majah. He put kohol eyeliner, antimony, what is it, antimony powder, whatever it's called. It's called kohol in Arabic. Uh, surma, there's different names for it. It does not break the fast. You can also be cupped, hijama. You know, you cup and you draw out the blood. This does not break the fast. Uh, however, if you give blood and it weakens you, Right. Sometimes people give blood and it be, they become weak. Then it's makru to do that. It's not haram. It becomes makru. But if you can give blood and you're not weakened by it, then there's nothing wrong with it. It's mubah. It's permissible. Ghiba does not break the fast. You know this hadith that says, uh, whoever makes ghiba, backbites, their fast is broken. Right. That's in the spiritual sense. Right. Meaning that your reward of fasting is gone. But it doesn't literally break your fast. Sometimes people read these hadith, they take a literal, and uh, they think their fast isn't broken, so they continue to eat after that, which you can't do anyway if you broke your fast. If one intends to break his fast, but does not do so, he has not broken his fast. Okay, let's say that there's a brother who 
you know, he's fasting and he knows he's fasting and then he sees a halal pizza somewhere and he's like, I gotta have it. So he goes for the pizza. He knows he's fasting. And if he eats it, he has to do kafara and qadha. So he goes to the pizza and then there's a crash, there's a car crash. So he goes to help people and he completely forgot about the pizza. Right? So he continued his fast. At the end of the day, he says, oh, I was going to break my fast. He still has his fast because he didn't actually do it. If you walk by and somebody is smoking and some of the dukhan, the smoke comes into your lungs, it does not break your fast. Okay? Try to avoid smoke, though. If dust or the dust of flour, let's say that you're working in a bakery and there's flour in the, in the air and you're inhaling it, that doesn't break your fast. If you're running and jogging, a fly goes down your throat. It doesn't break your fast. Unless you have a custom of eating flies. <laughs> Some people eat insects and they like it. If, if you're not in the custom of eating flies and it should happen accidentally, then it does not break your fast. There's no qadha. But if you eat insects, right, and you swallow an insect, then you have to make qadha, but no kafara. Okay. Um... If you should taste, let's say you took some cough medicine before, uh, at suhoor time, before fajr. You took some cough medicine and then it becomes fajr. And you can still taste some of the medicine. That doesn't break your fast. We talked about this. If you wake up in a state of janaba, uh, it does not break your fast. Because there was no touching done. If you enter a swimming pool and water goes into your ears and fills up your ears, but does not penetrate the core of your head, what's called the dimaha, it does not break your fast. But if you get water in your ear, it breaks your fast. If it goes inside your ear, right, and you can't get it out, and you know there's water in there, because when you move your head, you, feel, you hear this weird sound, that's broken your fast, you have to make qadal. So if you're gonna go swimming, wear earplugs, or don't go swimming, or don't put your head under water, because it's very risky. It's, for some people, it's impossible to keep water out of their ears. So again, if water fills up your ear canal, it doesn't go inside your head, that's fine. But as soon as it goes inside of your head, it reaches the core of your head, and your fast is broken. And you do qadha, you don't make kafara, you just simply make up that day. <coughs> if you use a Q-tip to take wax out, in the Hanafi school there's no problem. You can remove wax with a Q-tip. Uh, because this wax or dirt does not reach the dimaha, the core of the head again. If you have a cold and you swallow your mucus, right, that does not break your fast. In the Shafi'i school, according to Nur al uh, it must be expelled. You have to spit it out. In the Hanafi school, you can swallow mucus, no problem. <coughs> okay, vomiting. People have a lot of questions about vomiting. If you vomit intentionally, <coughs> intentionally, and it's more than a mouthful, then your fast is broken and you have to make qadha, not kafara. You vomit intentionally and it's more than a mouthful. If you vomit intentionally and it's less than a mouthful, you don't have to do anything. If you vomit unintentionally, even if you fill up a bucket, nothing, your fast isn't broken. Okay? If you vomit intentionally and swallow your vomit intentionally, a mouthful, your fast is broken and you make qadha. If you vomit unintentionally and swallow less than a mouthful unintentionally, then your fast is fine. Okay? Yes. We'll talk more about kafara in detail, inshallah. <clears throat> okay, now. Uh, so if somebody, let's say you have suhoor, right? And you didn't brush your teeth after. So you got some food particles in your mouth. And then you hear the avan, now it's fudger. And you touch right here, and you notice there's something there, right? So if that something is less than the size of a chickpea, chickpea's like pretty big, right? It's less than the size of a chickpea. And it was stuck in your mouth because of a meal you ate before uh, fudger, then you can swallow it, no problem. Okay? If it's equal to the size of a chickpea, and you swallow it, then your fast breaks, but you only have to do qadha. There's no kafara. 
But what you don't want to do is take it out, look at it, and then put it back in. Because if you do that, then you've broken your fast and you have to do kafara. Because it came from outside of your, even though it was in your mouth originally, the, the fact that you took it out and looked at it means you have to get rid of it now. Right? So, that's one scenario. Another scenario is this. Let's say that you're, you're fasting, it's the middle of the day, you pick up a sesame seed, really small. You put it on top of your tongue, which is makru to do, because you can't imitate something haram. Imitating something haram is makru tahriman. But let's say you wanted to chew it, and it completely dissolves in your saliva. It just dissolves. And you don't feel it go down your throat, your fast is okay. Okay? But if you take that sesame seed and you swallow it whole, now you have to make qadha and kafara, even though it's so small. And it was not something that was stuck in your mouth from support. It came from outside. Okay? Now, that which nullifies the fast and requires expiation and a makeup day. So, requires uh, kafara and qadha. What are those things? And he says here, these are, these are things that you do willingly. No one forces you to do it. And you do it intentionally. Right? It's not khata'an. It's not nasian. It's amadan. You do it on purpose, intentionally. Al-jima'a al-fa'il wa al bi. We won't translate. But basically, uh, intercourse uh, breaks the fast, and you have to do qada and kafar. Okay? Eating and drinking, whether for nourishment or medical benefit, breaks the fast and necessitates expiation and a makeup day. That's obvious. Swallowing rainwater after it enters the mouth. Again, this is intentional. You go outside in the rain, you go, yeah. And water comes into your mouth intentionally. Then you have to do qada and kafara. Eating raw meat, even if it's damaged, qada and kafara. He says if it's worm infested, then it doesn't break your fast. Um, you just have to do qada. There's no kafara. If you eat worm infested meat, because there's no nutrients left in it, and it's usually something that uh, a sane individual will not eat. So maybe this person's insane, or he's starving to death. Right? Eating fat or grease breaks it. Uh, you know, jerked meat, cured meat. Um, we talked about that. Uh, there's some pregnant women who eat this kind of soil called armani, and there's different names for it in different cultures. Uh, but this breaks the fast and necessitates uh, kafara as well. Qada and kafara. If you eat soil, clean or clay, um, and uh, you're in the habit of eating that, you're in the habit of eating like soil, then it necessitates qada and kafara. If you're not in the habit, then it's simple qada. Now here's an interesting one, a small amount of salt. If you, tr if you eat a small amount of salt or pepper, small amount, then you have to make qada and kafara. But if you have a mouthful of salt, you only do qada, a mouthful. Meaning if there's more salt, because it's not desirable or nourishing to have a mouthful of salt in your mouth. <clears throat> Okay, let's talk about the kafara. Faslun fil kafara wa ma yasputuha an dhimma. The expiation and that which excuses it. There's a beautiful hadith he quotes here initially, which is from Bukhari. Uh, the Prophet was approached by a man in Medina and said, Ya Rasulullah, I have ruined my fast. I had intercourse with my wife uh, during Ramadan. So the Prophet said to him, Can you manumit a slave? Can you free a slave? And he said, uh, no, I can't do that. He said, um, can you fast two consecutive months? And he said, no, I can't even fast Ramadan. And he said, can you afford to feed 60 poor people? And he said, no. So then the Prophet said them, he went out and he got a huge basket of dates and he gave it to the man, five minutes. And he gave it to the man and he said, take this and feed people. And the man said, 
He said, Wallahi, nobody is more poor than my own family. Right? So the Prophet said to him, take it and feed your family with it. So this shows the magnanimous nature of the Prophet وسلم, that this man who broke his fast and was supposed to do a 60-day kafara or, or feed 60 people, he ended up having a basket of dates for himself and his family because he was the poorest of the people of Medina. Now here's something interesting here he mentions. Let's say that you're fasting Ramadan and you intentionally broke your fast. So now you have to make kafara. He says here the expiation is excused if you're a woman who just came into her haid, her menses. You don't have to make kafara anymore. Just qada of that day. Or if you gave birth and you have nifas, postnatal bleeding. Or if you become sick, right? So let's say that you broke your fast and uh, you get the flu that same day. You basically really got lucky. Right? So now you don't have to make the kafara. But you can't do things intentionally. You can't say, like, I go out and eat lunch and then say, oh man, what did I do? Hurry up and break my leg. So make me sick, right? Or like drink some dirty water or something like that to make yourself sick. Also what he says here, uh, if you... Uh, if you broke your fast and then you go travel, you still have to do the kafara. For example, you go have lunch at a nearby cafe next to your house, and then you say, you know what, I'm going to go travel 50 miles away. Now I'm a traveler. Right? That doesn't help you. You have to still do kafara. You have to expiate and make qadda of that day. Now, what is the expiation? What is the kafara? He says here, al-kafara tu tahriru raqaba. So the expiation is to free a slave, which again is somewhat uh, obsolete, be it male or female, who is physically and mentally sound, even if the slave is a non-believer. And if he can't do that, he has to fast two consecutive, two consecutive months. And these days, must not coincide with the two Eids or the Ayyamu Tashriq. So what month is Ramadan? What's the month number? Ninth, right? So let's say you have to do Kafara. So what you do is, so obviously Eid al-Fitr is the first day of Shawwal. So that's 10-1, the 10th month, first day. And then you do the six days of uh, Shawwal, and then you pretty much have to begin immediately if you want to do your kafara, for, if you want to do fasting. There's different ways of doing the expiation, but if you want to fast 60 consecutive days, you pretty much have to begin no later than the second week of shawab. Why? Because you're going to run into an Eid. You're going to run into uh, Eid al-Adha, the 10th of Dhul Hijjah, which is a little bit more than two months away. So if you begin in the middle of Sha'ban and you, and you fast a month and a half and now you, oh, it's Eid, you have to start all over again. Okay? Because it's haram to fast on those days. Or you could feed 60 miskeen, ata'amim sitina miskina. You can feed 60 poor people, treat them to lunch and dinner at their respective time until they are content. So you go to a homeless shelter, for example. You have to feed 60 people, and they have to be the same 60 people. In other words, every person has to get two meals from you. So let's say you go to the homeless shelter, and there's 70 people there, right? It's obviously not good to kind of pick 60 and say, okay, you 10 can't get anything, right? So you feed everybody. But let's say at dinner, half of those people left, and now there's a new group. Right? That's why you sort of have to take roll call. You have to keep feeding people until, until 60 people have received two meals from you. Even if that means giving out a lot more than what is necessary. Right? And he says here that uh, it has to be satisfying for them. So if you go to like a homeless shelter in America, you don't give people samosas because they're not going to like it. When I was young, my friends would come over to my house we give them authentic Iranian cuisine, and we're eating it up. And I'm noticing my friend, he's not taking a bite. Well, he, he took one bite, and he's not taking any more. 
So what's wrong with it? I don't know. It just tastes weird. So it has to be what they normally eat. Right? Or he says here, you can give them uh, lunch one day and lunch the next day. Or dinner one night and dinner the next night. Or dinner one night and suhoor the next morning. In other words, they have to get 60 people, the same 60 people, no matter how you do it, have to get two square meals from you, the same 60 people. Okay? Or you fast 60 consecutive days. Or you free a slave. Or, this is the last thing we'll mention, or you find one person, one miskeen, and you feed them two meals a day for 60 days. Okay? Or you can give them an equivalent in cash. Or an equivalent in wheat or flour. Now, you have to go to a mufti for this and tell them your situation. Because you go to a homeless shelter, people don't have homes, what are they going to do with a sack of flour? Right? So that's probably not the way to do it. And the last thing we'll mention, one expiation covers all of the days that you missed in the past. So let's say, for example, that you didn't actually start fasting until you were 20 years old. Okay, so you reckon Bulu at 15. Unless you know for certain when did you become an adult. Let's say it's 15 years old. Use 15 as sort of the standard age. So you didn't fast for five years. Now you're 20. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. You owe five years of fasting. For every single one of those days, you have to make qada. You have to make up. So 30 times 5 is 150. So you owe 150 days of just making up fasts. Then you do one kafara, which is a 60-day fast on top of that. So 210 days is what you owe if you miss five years of fasting. Okay? In other words, you don't have to do kafara for every single day that you broke your fast intentionally. Unless you were fasting, then you intentionally broke it, you did kafara, then you broke it again intentionally. Then you have to do another one. Okay? So we'll stop there, inshallah. We'll come back. <coughs> Continue. <coughs> Question? Can you please explain the difference between uh, accidentally swallowing the water when you're making the food? You said for that one you have to make kapara and accidentally eat the food. But you don't have to make kapara at all, right? No. Or did I get wrong? No, it's uh, if you swallow water, khata'an. On accident. So you know you're fasting. You're making wudu, you already know you're fasting. And you, it was a complete accident. You accidentally swallowed it. You didn't mean to, but the, the reflex, the swallow reflex took over and you swallowed it. So it was totally unintentional. It was an accident. In this case, you just make qada, no kafar. You just make qada. I thought qada means you have to wake up one day. One day, that's what it means. Yes, one day. So you just make up that day. But then if I eat by mistake? If you forgot. So this is khata'an. But if it's nasian, if you totally forgot you were fasting, you forgot you were fasting. In the first case, you knew you were fasting, you accidentally swallowed. In this case, you totally forgot you were fasting, and you eat a big meal. You don't have to make qada nor kafara. But in the first case, do you continue with the fasting? You have to continue. It's wajib to continue. It's wajib to continue. It's makru tahrima to eat after that. But you, even if you do eat, you still have to make qada, uh, no kafa. Uh, and the other case is amadan. If you eat, you know you're fasting, it's intentional, you just wanted to eat, then you have to do qada of that day as well as kafa. So if you have 61 days and you do the kafa first and then the best way to do it is immediately after, on the starting of the seventh day of Shawwal, begin your kafara so you don't run into an Eid. Because if you don't start in the second week of Shawwal, then you have to wait until after, you have to basically wait until Muharram, or after the Eid, the middle of the Hijjah, then you start your 60 days. And remember, if you do 58 days, and then you break your fast, you have to start all over again. 60 consecutive. Or feed 60 people two meals a day of food that they believe to be satiating. Yes, but Yes. Is it no. uh, optional mm -hmm. in, in terms of, uh, or is it a choice as to whether to yeah. feed the poor? It's a choice. Fast? It is a choice. It is a choice, yeah. You so can there's choose. There's no like hierarchical. No, you can, you can choose to do 
any of those three. Even free a slave, but again, that's sort of, it's hard to, to find. Usually what people do is, what my experience is, people usually feed 60 people two meals or give the equivalent in cash. Yes? So if you're Sheikh Fani, what the text says, which is a really elderly person, so we're not talking about a senior citizen, because a senior citizen, 65, mashallah, my dad plays basketball with me. He's over 65. So he's not Sheikh Fani. May Allah preserve him. But a really old person, right? Then he pays a fidya, which is a, a, an expiatory, expiatory payment, which is nowadays the equivalent of 2.2 kilograms of wheat or cash equivalent for every day that he can't fast. Okay, so he pays that for the 30 days of Ramadan, which is not a lot at all for every day that he can't fast. So if you're really, really elderly, or if you have a chronic illness, let's say that you are a severe diabetic and you just cannot fast, uh, you can't go without eating for more than three hours, let's say. In this case, you pay the fidya as well. If you have a mild case of like diabetes, uh, then it, but basically you can pay the fidya, uh, but uh, if you should run into uh, like December, right, and the days are much shorter, you fast until like five o'clock or something, and now you have the ability to fast, you have to make up those fasts, even though you paid the fidya. The best thing to do in this case, if you have a mild case of like diabetes, is to, if it's, you know, during the summer months, if it's very long fasting, um, is to eat and then make the days up and the days are shorter. You can be sick during that time. You have a muddle. You can't go that long. Um, but all of these things, you should consult a physician. Right? Ask your physician, is it safe for me to fast for whatever, however long, and, and then go by that person's advice. But usually people have severe diabetes, they'll pay the fidya. Or very, very old. Yeah. Yes. So let's say the person who can make up in the day shorter, or in any case, someone who has to make up the fast, what if they pass away before that happens? And you know that they were able to make up the fast. Yeah, so if there were days, he has to update his will. He has to keep updating his will. So if there are days that are available to that person, which he could have made up his fast, and he did not, then for every one of those days, they have to take the amount of fidya from his legacy. For days that he could have made up those fasts. Yes? If I miss a uh, few days of this, for example, this Ramadan, I was sick for whatever reason, and I said, I plan to make up the days before the next Ramadan. But before the next Ramadan comes, I'm not sure how many days I did miss. I know I fasted a few of them. But I'm not sure how many days I need to make up. How do I need to handle that? Then you have to uh, basically estimate and err on the side of caution. So if you're not sure if it's three or four days, do five days. Do an extra day, that's okay. But we should keep track. That's why when you're making up the qadha, when you're making up fasting that you missed, you have to have ta'yin. In other words, you have to be specific in your intention. So you should always keep track of days that you miss, right? And that becomes a problem sometimes. People travel, I don't know if it's three or four days. If that's the case, do more than what is than, than what you think it is, just to be on the, on the safe side. But keep track of days that you miss. Write it down if you have to. Or have a calendar and circle the day. I was sick on this day. So that when you make qada, and you have to have that ta'yin, you can say in your intention, this is a fast, this is qada fast, for whatever, the 14th day of Ramadan that I was sick or traveling. Because you have to have that specificity anyway in your uh, in your in your qada. Now let's say go back to a previous example that you didn't fast for five years, right? You didn't start fasting until you're 20 years old. When you're making up these fasts, you also have to have specificity. So in your intention, you have to say this is so you have 150 days. In your intention, this is fast for day one, fast for day two, fast. For, you have to keep track of all of the days, right? When you're making qada, and the intention has to be done before fajr. For a call off when you're making up. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. Over here? Go ahead. If you're traveling and uh, fasting does not cause any hardship, uh -huh. you do something. Well, Ibn Abidin says if you begin the day as a muqim, you begin the day as a resident, and then you travel, you, ha you, you have to fast. 
It's, you can only not fast when you begin the day as a traveler. The day you are traveling. Yeah. Well, no, you begin the day as a traveler. So let's say that today, let's say that it's Ramadan and I wake up, I'm at my house and I'm fasting, obviously. And then I get in my car and I travel to LA. I cannot, I have to maintain my fast because I started as a resident that day. You can only do that, break your fast, when you begin the day as a musafir. Okay, that's the first issue. Uh, if you begin the day as a musafir, and it's not a hardship for you to fast, then it's better to fast, but you don't have to. So let's say that today I travel to LA, I'm fasting the whole day, even though I started as a resident. Now tomorrow I wake up in LA, right? So I begin the day as a musafir. I have a choice. I can fast or not. But for me, I'd probably fast. Because it's not seen as a hardship for me. Going driving to LA is not a big issue. And if you are traveling to the East Coast, the day is much shorter. Or if you're coming back west, the day is much longer. Do you still maintain the local time? Okay. Yeah, you have to. Those time zone things I don't know about. If you go to, uh, if you ask uh, Faraz Rabani, inshallah, Sheikh Faraz will give you a good, better answer. Yes. Uh, at what point do you become a musafir? As when you leave the house, when you leave the city? Um, you become a musafir with respect to what fasting? Well, for you to be considered a musafir, like at what point are you considered a musafir? Is it when you travel 40 miles or you leave the house? Yeah, well, generally speaking, uh, when you have an intention to go 48 miles away, you have that intention and you leave your town or your dwellings, as the text says, like your, basically your city, you leave your city. So say you have an intention to go to LA, uh, that's your intention, and your intention is to stay in LA for less than 15 days. Uh, so once you leave kind of the, the Bay Area, then you're considered a Musafa, and you can basically cut your prayer in half, but you can't start eating if it's Ramadan because you didn't begin your day as a Musafir. So if you're planning on staying there for let's say 16 days, uh -huh. when you arrive in LA, uh, do you consider yourself a Musafir for 15 days? The first 15 days and the last day? No, as soon as you get to LA, you're a resident. As soon as you get to LA. So the only time that you're really traveling then is in the distance between here and LA. But because you began your day as a Mokim, you have to fast during that distance anyway, because you'll get to LA in a few hours. So basically, you have to fast throughout. Yeah, but if you're if you anticipate in landing somewhere, let's say you anticipate in landing somewhere. If you're on an airplane, for example, let's say you have an intention to go study in Damascus, uh, and you're at an airport in Egypt, uh, so you're traveling, right? But on that day, since you anticipate. And landing in Damascus, and you have an intention of staying there for two years to study, then you have to fast on that day. Because you're going to land in a place where you're going to be muqim on that. You anticipate landing in a place where you're going to be living. So even though you're at Cairo Airport, you still have to fast. Yes? Uh, you think fasting all the sick, like kidney you know, pain or something like that? Uh, what do you if you're fasting and you have and you have sickness, you develop kidney pain, uh -huh. dehydration, or something like that. Yeah, if it's if it, if you're sick, you don't have to fast. Then you make call But if you, know, you develop you sickness, during, you, know, you are not sick before, but you know you felt sick during the fast. Yeah, you can break your fast if you develop a sickness uh, during the days of Ramadan. Uh, you can break your fast, or if you have a, a fear of getting sick. Even there are some people, for example, they work construction. And they're in, you know, heat temperatures that are over 100 degrees, six, seven hours, and they can feel like heat stroke coming on. You don't say, oh, I'm, I can't fast, it's hot on for me, I, I can't eat, it's hot on for me. In that case, it's, you're actually encouraged to drink water and eat, right? Also for uh, the text mentions, uh, uh, married women that might have a lot of household responsibilities, if they feel that fasting is going to make them extremely weak, then they can actually eat as well. They just have to make qadha of that day. There's no kafar. Yeah. Yes? So 
practical questions. Uh -huh. I know a lot of Muslims uh, want to celebrate Eid back home uh, in Asia. So they take the flight of Emirates, which is which departs like 4.45. The day they are fasting, so they continue the fast. But how do they break the fast based on the San Francisco time? Or like in three hours they are somewhere in between US and Canada based on that sunset. First question is that. Second is like I know uh, most of the uh, subcontinent in India, Pakistan, they begin Ramadan a day late. So by the time you reach there, you lost one day. Since US is ahead, so should we fast an extra day or like uh, because you'll be any, anyhow you'll catch the fast over there. Daily. Yeah, with that you would go with the community where you're currently residing. So, if yeah, if you fly to a different country and let's say that you've already fasted 30 days and they're fasted 29 days, you can't have it as an eid by yourself. So since the community is fasting, you, you'd fast with them as well. <coughs> and the time zone thing again, that's most ulama would say, uh, you know. Um, do the best you can with approximating, calculating times, or go with the local time, the closest normal time. Um, or even when you're actually flying overhead, um, to uh, uh, don't worry about that time. Just go wherever you land, that's where you go with. But this is, this is a, an issue that obviously is a sort of uh, contextualized for different people. So, But Sheikh Faraz, Better answer regarding time zones. It's a difficult issue, I guess. Excuse me. I was going to mention that I asked the exact same question from Chef Faraz from last visit. Mm -hmm. The example I gave was coming from East Coast to here, mm -hmm. and the time of Maghrib keeps on extending. The time of breaking my fast keeps on extending for another two hours or three hours. Which yeah. he, he faced the same, so exactly the same thing last year when we right. from Canada. And his response was that you must watch through the window of the airplane or so the time of that zone mm -hmm. wherever you are. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter where you started it. Whatever you are, that's the time that you must care about. If you must follow, if your fast extends to two hours, it extends two hours. Your Maghrib doesn't start until you see the uh, Maghrib time, whatever in the mid-day you are. Yeah, that, that's, no, yeah, that's a short journey. But there are some journeys where, like, the, like one of the brothers was saying, he's going to fly over the North Pole where it's never going to get dark. You're two days in sunlight. So fasting for that long is obviously, so in that case, you'd go with whatever your normal time was here, and then you can break your fast. So again, it depends on, it's a case-by-case -case sort of scenario. But yeah, going from east to west, you know, you're, you're crossing about three hours. That's the, the time zone. So that's easy to do by looking out the window, but sometimes it, become, it can become very difficult to determine it. Any more? Yes? The intention for the fasting until before the Zawal or The intention for fasting Ramadan? Yeah. You have until before Zawal on, in the daytime. Yeah. So if that happens, so let's say you forgot to make your intention and you ate food, then you make Qadha. Okay, so it says 10 o'clock in the morning, you didn't make your intention for fasting, you haven't made your intention, and you have a breakfast, then you make call Um But that's if you forgot to make your intention. Uh, however, if uh, you make your intention, and then you eat, obviously, then you have to make kafal. That's for Ramadan. Ramadan, yes. If he forgot to make his intention, he totally forgot to make his intention before the Zawal. <clears throat> yeah, then he makes call off that. But it's not like someone can say, I'm going to hold off my intention until, because then he's, he's not forgetting. He's doing that on purpose. He totally just forgot to make his intention. 
In other words, he forgot he was fasting. That's what that means. If you eat during Ramadan, you forgot you were fasting. He didn't have an intention. Yes? The ayah is the meat of fasting. Shahida is with the the eyesight. eyesight. So that's why uh, the Shaykh here he quotes that verse when he talks about if you're alone and you sight the moon and the Qadi doesn't take your sighting, then you have to fast because you witness the moon. You witness with your eyesight. So we use technology in the sense that uh, not to establish the day of Ramadan, but to establish was the moon sighted. Because we, we establish Ramadan by sighting the moon. We have technology to co communicate with Muslims all around the world. And as as long as we get a, a report back that al jamul Azim, that a large group of Muslims has sighted the moon, then we begin our fasting. Right? But calculating in advance without sighting the moon, it's permissible to do it, but it's against the sunnah. Yes. What are some of the sunnahs of Sahur? The sunnahs of? Sahur. Uh, Sahur. This, so eating Sahur is mustahab. Suhoor is not sunnah, it's mustahab. There's great blessings in, in it. So, with suhoor, it's mustahab to do suhoor. It's also mustahab to delay it until just a few minutes before Salat al-Fajr. And that's how the Prophet Wasallam would eat the suhoor. <coughs> so, the ulama say, the time it takes to recite 50 ayat of Qur'an. So, you're eating a quick meal, very close to Fajr time. It's mustahab to do that. Uh, drink a lot of water during that time. Not a lot. Don't have like a steak or something like that because you're going to regret it. You're going to wake up, you're going to be parched, thirsty, and you have to fast the entire day. And then you're going to convince yourself, I'm sick, I'm going to break my fast. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Sisters have questions. One of the questions was uh, about the toothpaste brushing and waking up after uh, pleasure or so. Is that, what's the point that? So, brushing your teeth with a toothbrush that doesn't have paste is mubah, it's permissible. Brushing with, tooth, with toothpaste is makru tanzihan. Brushing with paste is makru tanzihan. I mean, you can still do it, but uh, it's slightly disliked to do that. Brushing with a siwak that is sunnah, even if it's wet, is sunnah. Totally permissible. In fact, sunnah to do that, even if it's wet or damp. Okay, so be careful about pastes. I know you know people deal with others and they're working. Your breath is going to smell anyway because you're not eating anything. It's going to smell regardless. <laughs> uh, but if you do use paste, be very very careful, especially if you're going to brush your tongue or something and you get back down there, and because sometimes you might be tent, you might actually swallow some of the toothpaste. And then if you do that, then you have to make all You have to make up that day of fasting. But brushing with just a toothbrush is, is permissible. What about mouthwash? Yeah, mouthwash as well uh, is, uh, is makrut and zihan. You can rinse your mouth out with water, no problem. This is mubah. It's not makrut with water. But anything that has flavor in it. Like chewing gum also. Chewing gum uh, that has sugar or flavor uh, is impermissible. You cannot do it. If you chew gum that has no flavor, no sugar is basically wax, and there's some gums like that. This is considered makru tanzihan, because there's a chance you could swallow it, and it also makes you salivate a lot, right? So actually trying to sa make yourself salivate is makru. So looking at food all day long will cause you to salivate. Yeah, it's makru to do that, because you'll start, you'll start salivating, and you start swallowing that, and that's considered makru. So it's better not to even look at food. Yes. Uh, what was that? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Nose, nose plug? Nose drops. Oh, nose drop, yeah. Yeah, with nose drops, the, the author of the text 
He says, taking drops into the nose will break your fast, but uh, will not require kafara. So like if you take nasal spray, and the only reason why you take that is for a medicinal reason. Let's say that you just can't breathe, but you don't want to eat food, right? Um, so you can take some nasal spray, but you know, you don't want to, you're not necessarily sick enough where you can just eat and that's fine. Um, and basically, it's, it's the same thing as eating, though, if you're sick. You know, if you're sick, you can eat, no problem, you make it up later. Um, and you can take nasal spray, but you have to make kada of that day. You know. But there has to be, you have to have some sort of medicinal need to do that. These are masail of the of the ulama. So when these madahib were promulgated by these eminent scholars, these are some of the issues that they had to work out uh, because that's the reality of the human condition. These issues will continuously come up. Obviously, it's all based on the Quran and Hadith, right? But what does somebody do if, like we said, someone swallows an insect on accident? What do you do, right? What does that constitute? Then you have to go to a scholar that can understand the sources and give a legal ruling, right? So the Quran sets a foundation, Hadith sets a foundation, but there's something called ijma and there's Qiyas as well in the religion, which we derive legal rulings based on established precedent. Right? Um, so these these are the these are the workings, these are the results of major ijtihad of the ulama based on Quran and Hadith. Yes. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, you can. Uh, your primary intention, however, is for qadha. If you're going to make up Ramadan, uh, let's say you miss two days of Ramadan, uh, so you can actually make that up as one of your six days during those six days of Shawwal. Make a double intention, but your primary intention is the qadha, and inshallah, you'll get the reward of the six days of Shawwal as well. So you have to have ta'yin here, you have to specify though. This is for that day of Ramadan I missed, right? And inshallah you'll have the reward of the six days of Shawwal as well. There are some ulama who say you can't do that, but the majority say you can. Yes? This is a bit of a follow-up question. So can you combine all three, Akada, Kafara, and also one of the six of Shawwal? Um, you cannot combine Qadha and, and Kafara, no. But you can combine one of the six with when you're doing kafara. You can do that as well, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, qada has to be done separately. Yeah. How about the uh, if, if the movie cites at any part of the world, uh -huh. like in Pakistan, India, Indonesia, yeah. the America, then not in America, then we can. This is an ikhtilaf amongst the ulama. The dominant opinion in the Hanafi school is exactly that. Any, any place in the world where the moon is sighted, if it's reliable, there's Jamun Adim, there's a great group of people that have sighted it and it's accepted, then every Muslim in the globe has to begin fasting. That's one opinion. Another opinion is that it's regionalized. Like Imam Ghazali discusses in the Ihya, that if a city is within six miles, it's called Farsakhan, within six miles of another, then that's considered sort of one locale. So, for example, according to this opinion, this is a Shafi'i opinion, it's generally a Shafi'i opinion, that uh, somebody in San Ramon cites the moon, right, and it's been accepted. That means all of the cities and towns within a six mile radius of San Ramon begins fasting as well. It's actually incumbent upon Danville and Dublin and Alamo, those cities, to begin fasting as well. 
Uh, however, if the city is more than six miles away, then they go by their own region. So if someone in Saturn sights the moon, then someone in Fremont, he has a choice to either go with the first opinion that it's global or another opinion that it's regional. So he has a choice to do that. But if someone in Union City should sight the moon, then the person in Fremont is incumbent upon the person in Fremont then to begin fasting as well. <coughs> so it's a difference of opinion. Usually Hanafi school, it's more global. The Shafi school is more regionalized. But even for the Hanafis, you can go with the, the regional sighting as well. So what yeah? is the moon what is the moon supposed to look like? What is the moon supposed to look like? Yeah. Who, who's got moon sighting? Like a what? I'm just kidding, I say it's supposed to be like the sun. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's very faint. So very, very faint. You have to really be looking in the right direction. Every time I go from sighting, it doesn't show up. So. <laughs> or we can't make it or something. Something strange happens. Yes, question? That question is just... I mean, uh, if the other answer allowed. Yes. Okay. About the person, one of the moon. I did research on this. Based on everything, but in Chicago, I did some work for teaching. But I will ask the other if you can discuss after all the books and ask her. Yes. What if you were in an area and there was a claim of moon sighting? Oh. Uh, you fast on a Monday, a Nafila fast, and then your cousin visits you from a different town or something, and now you're fasting. The Prophet said there's a, there's a reward, a great reward for you to break your fast and entertain your guest. But then you just have to make it up later. Yes, this is Nafila, yeah, Nafila. Nafila or Mandub or Mustahab fast. Not a Sunnah or Wajib or Fadl. Okay. Any other questions before we continue with our. Yes? Pick a community to go with and make sure that you fast at either 29 or 30 days. You can pick either community to go with, as long as they're following what is considered to be permissible in their methodology. But again, what you don't want to do is fast 28 days because you're following both at the same. You started late and then you celebrated eat early. That's, that's Sometimes that happens to people when they have two different masjids in their locale and they're having two different methodologies. Right? It's okay to pray in either masjid, no problem whatsoever. You can pray Jummah, you can pray Tarawir, you can pray any, anything you want with, with that masjid. But when it comes to Eid, we have to make sure that we fast it 29 or 30 days. And it's best to stay consistent with one community. It's best to stay consistent with one of those communities. So that we at least fast 29 days. Yeah. Just to follow up to that question, is there any possibility of like uh, seeing the moon uh, on uh, like 28th day of, uh, of fasting, 
because they're following um, not local uh, moon sighting, there's a remote moon sighting that we saw my brother is explaining. Uh, that one is Saudi Arabia and another is remote country in South Asia. Yeah, it's possible because that would be the 29th, 29th day. So a month can be 29 days long. So um, the 28th day, that Maghrib is the 29th night. So that's the earliest that the moon can be sighted. But the 28th night cannot, it cannot be sighted. No. Unless somebody made a mistake in their calculation. Or somebody made a mistake in reckoning the months. Yeah, it can't be sighted the night of the 29th or the night of the 30th. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it happened a lot in from Saudi Arabia because they're following Um al Pura calendar, which is uh -huh. a calendar that was written by some some students uh -huh. a very long time ago. That they were, you know, just doing the the best they had, uh -huh. and that calendar is known to be worldwide that is the worst one that you can follow. Yeah, and that's that's the main problem. Sometimes they live in off two days. Yeah, and that's the biggest problem that we have in the Ummah because they hear Saudi Arabia, then they come in and say. Well, it was Eid, so, but then they, they, twice they had to kind of regret this and make, make a, you know, to make, a, yeah. to make up two days, two days. Yeah. One day, two days. It was like unbelievable. Yeah. That was uh, about five, six years ago. Yeah. So yeah, that's exactly. why we, we, we know that there's a big flaw, you know, there's a big problem. And so mm -hmm. we, we, that's why we say moon sighting. That when I start hearing this for exactly. years, moon. I said, no, moon sighting, and that's it. Moon sighting, and that's it. I'm not going by, by nobody, you know, yeah. Saudi Arabia. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, calculated or has uh, programmed the sun and the moon. So they're not going to make a mistake. But we're going to make a mistake in calculating our own calendars. And that's what happens quite often. So yeah, if you're following the sunnah, no, you cannot sight the moon on the 28th night. Because it's impossible. But if you follow one of these calendars that was invented by some students and there's a lot of errors in it, then oh, I'm, I'm citing the moon on the 26th night. What's going on here? <laughs> Obviously, somebody made a mistake. Yeah. Now, the brother's issue is like the two mushrooms, right? So, yeah. no more possibility, like maybe the 28th um, uh, Ramadan, it's not like 29th night or something. They made a mistake and then maybe brother some, somehow saw the moon. Well, you have to fast at least 29 days. So, so you have to fast 29 days. Moon setting is done. Moon setting is done, okay. So we'll continue, inshallah, with our text and write down if you have any other questions, we'll, we take them, inshallah. So he has an next section here, which is that which nullifies the fast, though it does not require expiation. Okay, so it breaks your fast, but you don't have to do kafara, you just have to do qaba. We covered some of these already. So he says, for example, eating raw rice or dough or flour, the fast is nullified, but you don't have to do the expiation. And the reason is because these things contain no nourishment and they're not usually things that people eat. Okay? Um, we mentioned this all earlier, a mouthful of salt, right? It's not desirable, it's not nourishing, it's not pleasurable. A pinch of salt, however, is very pleasurable. So if you have a little pinch of salt, then qadha and kafara, but a mouthful of salt, just qadha. He mentioned eating something like cotton or paper, right? Uh, it breaks the fast without necessitating a kafara. So because they're not nourishing, they're not desirable. <clears throat> Uh, swallowing a pebble or metal, a piece of iron or soil nullifies the fast with no expiation. Uh, taking an enema or pouring drops of medicine through the nostrils, you know, nasal spray, we talked about that. Uh, if there's a me medicinal need for it, uh, will uh, require a qadal, but no expiation. Abu Yusuf said that taking an enema or not or taking something through the nose does require expiation, but his opinion is not the mu'tamid, it's not the dominant opinion, the relied upon opinion in the Hanafi school. 
If somebody forces something down your throat, like you're sleeping and someone pours water, like a, or if you're, you know, you have a cruel older brother or something like that, and he corners you and says, drink this or I'm going to beat you up. And so you drink it, right? Uh, there's no kafara, but you do have to make up that day. There's a Okay. <clears throat> Um, applying medicine to a wound on the stomach or the head, and then this medicine will penetrate the body and reach the core of the body. Uh, this will require qada with no kafara. If you swallow uh, rain, water, or snow accidentally, right, khata'an, this is qada with no kafara. Again, if it's amadan, if you go out and try to drink the rain, right, uh, then there's kafara and qada. We talked about that. Um, <clears throat> if one is coerced to break his fast uh, through intercourse, like a tyrannical king orders a man to have intercourse with his wife, stranger things have happened, uh, then there's qada without kafara. We mentioned this one interesting one. A married woman or slave uh, breaks her fast for fear, fear of falling ill because of the duties that she performs will cause a lot of hardship, right? Uh, then she can break her fast without kafara, but she has to make qabal. Uh, the Hanafi school also mentions if a woman has uh, a really ill-tempered husband, uh, she's allowed to actually taste the food, but she has to spit it out, and that does not require a qabal. She can taste it without swallowing the food, right? Apparently, some men have... Strong opinions about the taste of food. Um, okay. Yeah, we've talked about this stuff here. <clears throat> yeah, we talked about this. If a person begins the day as a traveler and then intends residence and thereafter breaks his fast by eating, expiation is not necessary even though it was forbidden for him to eat. We talked about that as well. Let's say you wake up and you're a traveler, but on that day, you expect to reach your final destination. You actually have to fast on that day. But let's say that you didn't fast. There's no kafara. You just make qadal. Okay. But if you're not sure you're going to reach your final destination, maybe you'll get there, maybe you're not, uh, then uh, you can actually, it's the best to fast but you can actually uh, eat as well without qadal, because you weren't sure there was doubt. <coughs> hmm. Yeah, we talked about most of this. <clears throat> There's no kafara uh, if a person breaks a fast other than Ramadan. Okay, so we talked about, for example, if you're fasting sunnah, if you're fasting the day, day of Ashura, and then you intentionally break your fast, you don't make kafara of that. Okay, but you have to make qadha. It's wajib upon you to make qadha of a ruined mandub mustahab or sunnah fast. Okay, however, if you make another mu'ayyan, you make a fast based on a vow, right? A specific vow. For example, you say something like, I swear to Allah, that this Thursday I'm going to fast, right? And then you don't fast. Technically, you've broken an oath. You've broken an oath, and there's an expiation for breaking an oath. Not as bad as this expiation. You'd have to fast for, for three days. Is it three days or 30 days? Let me check. Three days. Three or 10 days? Yeah. Uh, you can either feed 10 poor people, right, two meals a day, or clothe them, free a slave, or fast for three days. Yeah. If you break an oath. Also have to be careful about uh, when we make istinja, when you're cleaning your, yourself, uh, that you dry yourself before you stand up because water that's drawn into the body will break the fast as well. Uh, it will require a qadal if water is drawn into your body. So make sure you, you dry yourself during Ramadan. Uh, what if somebody smokes? Someone who smokes, there's no kafara, there's qada. Right? So someone's smoking during Ramadan. Smoking, by the way, according to the jumhur of the ulama, 
contemporary ulama is haram. It used to be the people follow the old fatwa that it was makru uh, because they didn't know, the ulama didn't know all of the health risks of smoking. But now that they're known, the fatwa has changed generally that it's actually haram to smoke, right? So, um, first of all, someone's smoking during Ramadan, you should advise them. Uh, we, we should advise them because they are doing something haram, that this is actually haram. And number two, you're smoking during Ramadan. Right? But should they smoke, there's no kafara, there's just qala. In some Muslim majority countries, the first thing that men do is smoke. They have cigarettes in their mouth, I've seen it. Cigarette in the mouth, they're waiting for the adhan, they got the lighter. As soon as it says, Allah, <laughs> he doesn't even say, get to the akbar. <laughs> Immediately he starts smoking. That's how they break the fast. We talked about vomiting here. <clears throat> talked about food stuck in the teeth. Okay, so here's something about fainting or temporary insanity. If one faints for the entire period of Ramadan, uh, he is liable to make up the fast days except the day that he fainted, okay? If you fainted, let's say you fainted for three days, you fainted on Monday, and you fainted for three days. So you make up those days except for the day you fainted. If one is temporarily insane for part of the month, he makes up those days except the day he went insane. If one suffers insanity for the entire month, it is considered to be a permanent state, and he does not need to make it up. Okay. Remember, one of the uh, prerequisites of fasting, or actually um, being responsible for the sharia, is having aql, is having intellect. You're not insane. And you can't say, well, my mom calls me insane, so I'm insane. <laughs> or I'm clinically insane. Or something. You have to really clearly be insane, to the point where you have no tamyiz. You, you, can't, you can't explain the difference, for example, between a fard and a sunnah. If I ask you what is the difference, you just you don't get it. Even if you just read it over and over, you just don't get it. Then this person is seen as not being all there, right? Clearly insane. Right. Um, so when is it necessary to refrain from eating during the day? If a person breaks his fast, it is necessary to abstain from eating and drinking the remainder of the day. We talked about that. It's wajib for you. To, to continue fasting and not eat. If a woman becomes pure after menstrual period or after postnatal uh, bleeding, uh, then she must refrain from eating the remainder of the day. Okay, and she has to make up that day, called off. Okay. Uh, he also says here, it is sunnah for the one who is permitted to eat to do so in private. Otherwise, he will be accused so let's say that uh, you're traveling, okay? You're traveling, you woke up as a traveler, you're traveling, and you're uh, somewhere in Houston, for example. Um, uh, you don't you know, go outside at a public cafe and start having lunch, because Muslims might pass you and start accusing you. And a Muslim does not put himself in a position of blame. So if you have an excuse to eat, you do it privately, right? You don't want to draw blame upon yourself. So there is a group, so the above are required to make up their days missed. Nafsa, the nafsa is the woman who is uh, bleeding postnatally. She has to make up her fast. The ha'ib, uh, the woman on her menses, she must make up her fast. The musafir must make up his fast. And the marid, the sick one, makes up his fast. If a boy matures after true dawn, right? So maturity is between ages 9 and 15. And it happens either uh, through a dream of some sort where there's an ejaculation or a girl goes, begins her menses. Uh, if that should happen, uh, if, a, if a boy sh should have that happen to him, then he has to fast the rest of the day and he has to make up that day as well. But if somebody becomes Muslim, right, then they have to fast the rest of the day, but they don't have to make up that day. Because he wasn't Muslim, and the Sharia fasting does not apply to non-Muslims. Non in a Muslim country, non-Muslims are not required to fast, obviously, right? <clears throat> OK. 
Yeah. Okay, so that which is not disliked when fasting, and that which is recommended, disliked actions. So these are things that are makru when fasting. Tasting something without a reason. Tasting something without a reason is makru. Uh, and he mentions here what we mentioned earlier. However, a wife with a husband who has ill temper, she can taste the food as long as she doesn't swallow it, and it's not makru. Chewing something without an excuse is makru. We talked about that as well. Um, kissing or caressing while fasting is disliked. If one is not sure that these will not cause an orgasm or sexual intercourse, this is the evident view on the matter. So there's actually two hadith here. This is why it's, it's dangerous to go directly to hadith if we're lay people. A man came to the Prophet ﷺ, both hadith are sound hadith. Came to the Prophet ﷺ, can I kiss my wife while I'm fasting in Ramadan? He said, yes. Another man came to him, same question. He said, no. So how do you make jama' of these hadith? How do we reconcile the hadith? We look at the siyaq, we look at the context of the hadith. So the first man that came to him was a very old man. A very old man, right? So there's no fear of him, uh, you know. Uh, taking it to the next step, as it were. But the young man, right, it becomes dangerous. So he told the young man, don't do that. But the old man, he said, yes, you can do it. Generally, however, kissing and caressing while fasting is disliked to makru, unless one is sure that it won't lead to other things. The Prophet ﷺ would kiss his wives while fasting. Bukhari and Muslim. Rubbing oil on the mustache is not disliked during the fast. Well, kuhur, we mentioned that. Putting kohol eyeliner, antimony powder, is not makru, it's totally permissible. <clears throat> Even if the taste of it should come to your saliva. Cupping, hijama, drawing blood, bloodletting, fast, none of these things are makru, unless it makes you weak. We mentioned that as well. The siwak he mentions as well, the siwak, um, the, the tooth stick, even if it's damp or wet, is a sunnah, is not makru. Imam Shafi'i said, however, using the siwak at the end of the day is makru because it takes away the, the, uh, the, the scent of the breath, which is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is something that is repulsive towards Bani Adam, but beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like the, the dumb shaheed, the blood of the martyr is tahir, according to sharia. You don't see blood, they don't want to touch it. Something dirty. But this is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Taking a bath, rinsing the mouth or nostrils for other than wudu is not disliked. If it's water, right? You can rinse your mouth out. Don't rinse your mouth out with Pepsi and then spit it out. <laughs> right? This is mokru and it can actually be haram because you're, it's going to make you salivate and not, not all of that stuff is going to get out of your mouth. It was very dangerous. But let's say that you have a job that is physically demanding and you have a parched mouth, you can rinse your mouth out. Just be very careful not to swallow the water. If you should swallow it accidentally, you may call up. <clears throat> you can take a bath, no problem. You can wrap yourself in wet clothes, no problem about that. This is the dominant opinion. Abu Hanifa said it's disliked, but Abu Yusuf has the more timid opinion in this, the dominant opinion. This hadith of Abu Dawood that the Prophet used to pour water over his head while fasting due to thirst or heat. This hadith in Abu Dawood. Ibn Umar would wet his clothes and wrap himself in them while fasting. This is in Bukhari. Which, what is recommended when fasting? What is mustaha when fasting? He says three things. The suhoor, the pre-dawn meal, is mustahab, recommended. We talked about that as well. well we talked a lot about a lot of things during the Q&A session. Uh, observe suhoor, there is blessing in it. This is in Bukhari. The pre-dawn meal. Try to do it if you can. It's mustahab. Also, again, to delay. To delay the suhoor is mustahab. Uh, to be in haste in breaking the fast on a day there is no obstruction is mustahab in accordance with the above hadith. Right? So that was a question we got earlier. 
is it's best to break the fast as soon as it becomes maghrib. Don't delay it. If you delay it without a reason, it becomes makru. He has a section here called Fortuitous Circumstances. Al-marid wal-hamil wal-murdir. The ill, the pregnant, and the breastfeeding. The very common issues as well. <clears throat> that the circumstances which are deemed illegal and for which no sin is awarded for the breaking of fast are eight. Illness, travel, coercion, right? Ikra, if someone forces you, uh, there's no sin, there's no kafara. Pregnancy, breastfeeding, extreme hunger and thirst, and old age. And hunger and thirst, what he means here is fear of death or fear of heat stroke or fear of something terrible going to happen to you, right? Not just, yeah, I'm really hungry. Like, you know, we say sometimes, I'm starving. Really? No, you're not. We don't know what starving is. Right? In each of these cases, one is permitted to break and leave the days of fasting at hand and make them up later. A really old man can pay the fidya. We'll talk more about fidya. The expiatory payment. So he mentions here, it is permissible to break one's fast for one who is ill and fears aggravation in his illness or a delay in his recovery. So here it's best to consult a physician. The pregnant or nursing woman is permitted to leave the fast if she fears a loss of mind, death, or illness upon herself or her child. If, she, if the fear is present, she is to delay the fast to a later date. The Prophet ﷺ said, Allah has remitted half the prayer to the traveler and fasting to the traveler, the woman who is suckling an infant and the woman who is pregnant, Abu Dawood. Then he mentions, what is the nature of this fear? What is this khawf based on? It's based on tajriba, on past experience and the akhbar from a tabib, from a physician. So a pregnant woman must consult her physician. Is it okay for me to fast? Take the advice of a physician in this regard. It doesn't matter whether the physician is Muslim or not. It's better to have a Muslim physician because he has experience with fasting. It is permitted to break the fast if one has ata shadid or jur shadid. If one has like really unbearable thirst or hunger in which he fears his demise or the loss of his mind. Like we gave the example, construction worker working in the heat, 100 degrees, eight hours a day. Sometimes it's going to fall off the roof. Then you say, no, no, relax. Have a drink. Make up the day later. <clears throat> it's not supposed to be something that's hard. It's not supposed to be something that is torturous, missing the point of the fast. The next section is called Al-Musafir, <clears throat> the traveler. The traveler is legally permitted to break his fast. However, it is better, provided it will not harm him, and provided that most of his companions accompanying him are also fasting, that each person is funding his own expenses separately. So it goes into a lot of detail here. Um, but it's verse, based on the verse that was quoted, فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيدًا أَوْ عَلَى صَفْرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَامٍ أُخَارٍ that if you're sick or you're traveling, make up the days later. So this is very general. So the question is, what is sick? What does that mean? So this requires ijtihad. What is traveling? What constitutes a musafir? This, this takes ijtihad. So we have to look at uh, the hadith. We have to look at the ulama. So um, the next part here, he talks about the fidya. We covered this a little bit as well. Who can pay the fidya? Expiatory payment, literally the ransom or penalty fee, uh, is uh, someone who's extremely elderly or someone who's chronically ill. Okay. Someone who is ill and pays the fidya, should he recover, he's expected to make up his fasting even though he paid the fidya. Then he has something here called uh, One who vowed to fast his entire life 
and weakened as a result. There are people like this. They say, I'm going to fast every day of my life. Say, Ya Allah, if you make this happen, every day I'm going to fast. Because they got into some sort of zealous hal, right? <laughs> so, and then they get very weak from this over the years. They can't do it anymore. So what happens here? He says here, if this should happen and he becomes weak and feeble and now he can no longer provide for his family, then he has to break his fast and pay the fidya for every single day. The rest of his life, he has to pray the fidya. However, if he cannot do that due to financial difficulty, he has Allah, and he makes toba, and it's released. <laughs> the permissibility of breaking a voluntary fast, with or without a reason. So he says here, it is permitted for a person who is performing a voluntary fast to break it with no reason. This is the opinion of Abu Yusuf, and it's a dominant opinion in the madhab. Aisha relates a hadith, anha, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, he was fasting one day, and then a certain type of food called haze was brought to him, uh, and he began to eat from it in the middle of his fasting. This was a nafila fast, not a Ramadan fast. A nafila fast, a totally extra credit fast, you can break it for no reason. You saw something you want to eat, you can eat it. But remember now, it becomes wajib to make up that fast. It's qadha, and you have to make qadha, wajib. وَالْضِيَافَةُ عَذْرُونَ عَلَى الْأَذْهَرُ لِلْدَيْفِ وَالْمُضِيفِ So then, hospitality, entertaining, we talked about this also, entertaining is regarded as a reason for breaking a voluntary fast. The Prophet ﷺ, this is the actual hadith, here, whoever breaks his fast for the right of his brother, the rewards of fasting a thousand days are written for him. And upon making up the day, the rewards of another thousand days. So the ulama say, if you're fasting, a nafila fast, and a guest shows up, then thank Allah that you can break your fast. The promises must be from the category which is wajib, such as fasting, prayer, hajj, umrah, freeing a slave, i'tikaf, or charity. In other words, there are circumstances in which these things become wajib. So we make a vow, when we make a nazar, it has to be something like this. Right? You say, oh Allah, for example, grant me a son and I will make hajj. Uh, not hajj, I will make umrah. I will make umrah. Oh Allah, grant me a son and I will uh, fast ten days. Grant me a son and I'll free a slave. I'll make i'tikaf. It has to be something like that, from something that originates from a category that is wajib. You can't say, oh Allah, if you grant me a son, I'll visit a graveyard. That does not originate from a wajib category. Oh Allah, give me a son, I'll eat a hamburger. Right? Something like that. وَأَيَّكُونَ maqsudan. It also has to be a primary act, not a requisite act. So you can't say, oh Allah, give me a son, I'll make wudu. No, you say, oh Allah, give me a son, I'll pray something extra. And that leads up to the last thing. وَأَنْ يَكُونَ لَيْسَ wajiban. It can't be something that's already wajib. So you can't say, Oh Allah, uh, heal my sickness, I'll pray maghrib. Right? Some people do that, the youth. Oh Allah, do this and I'll become a good practicing Muslim. I'll start doing my faraid. You're supposed to do that already. What are you talking about? You're supposed to do that. Right? Why do you want to become rewarded for something that you're s supposed to do? Right? <coughs> So it's something that's not already required of the person. It's an additional act. So you can't say, Ya Allah, if, I, if you do this, I'll make hajj, even though you can't afford it. You're supposed to make hajj when you, when you can't afford it. With Umrah, you can do that. Okay? He also mentions that likewise, sajda tilawa, you can't do that. You can't say, Oh Allah, do this, and I'll make sajda tilawa. It's already wajib in the Hanafi school. To make such a tilawa, should you hear the Quran or read the Quran? Remember, the vow is expressed orally; it's on the tongue and the heart, whereas the intention is usually in the heart. <coughs> okay. Okay. The last part here actually went through most of what I actually wanted to discuss. Um, <clears throat> okay, yeah. We'll talk about the then. 
This is the last part of the text. The Kitab al-Siyam is on the Irtikaf. What is Irtikaf? He says, Al-Iqamatu bi niyatihi fi masjid tuqamu fihi al-jama'ah bi fi'l salawat al-khams. The definition of irtikaf is to remain in seclusion in a masjid where the five daily prayers are performed in congregation. The scriptural proof text of irtikaf is Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 125. We covenanted with Ibrahim and Ismail that they should sanctify my house and those who compass it round and use it as a retreat or bow or prostrate themselves therein. The ta'ifina wa la'aqifina wa ruka is sujood. So that's in the Qur'an. Yatikaf is established in the Qur'an. <clears throat> there is no religious retreat except in a congregational masjid. This is a hadith in Tabarani. So you can't go to your zawiyah, your Sufi lodge. You can't go to your private khalwa. You can't go to your uh, madrasa. Right? You can't go to the musalla in some center that nobody goes to. Right? Yatikaf is done, and this is for men, obviously, is done in the masjid, a congregational masjid where the five daily prayers are performed. Not necessarily the masjid where the Jum'ah is performed, but a masjid that has, that's open for the five daily prayers, even if no one shows up for those prayers. It's still there and available to be used for the five daily prayers. Okay? Itikaf, or the female, is the masjid of her home. Her itikaf is not in the masjid, in the Hanafi school. She does not make her itikaf. She doesn't sleep in the masjid. She sleeps in her home. She has itikaf in her house. And what are the itikaf? The types of itikaf. Wal itikaf ala thalathati aqsam. There's three types of itikaf. Al wajib. The first type is wajib, which is based on another, based on a oath, an oath. If you take an oath, for example, you say, Ya Allah, heal my sickness and I will make i'tikaf. Now it is wajib for you, should that condition come to pass, that you make your i'tikaf, it is wajib. Fasting is also conditional when observing this type of i'tikaf. If you make an oath to do i'tikaf, it's minimum 24 hours, including a fast. So when you enter the masjid, it must be before maghrib. You enter the masjid. You spend the night in the masjid. And you're busy with azkar and salawat or study. You're praying. And then you fast the whole rest of the next day. And then you can leave after iftar the next day. Maghrib. At least 24 hours minimum. If you make an oath that if Allah does something, you will make i'tikaf. That's the first type of i'tikaf, wajib fil manthur. The second type is sunnah mu'akkada, wa sunnah mu'akkada, which is fi fil ashr al-akhir min Ramadan. The last 10 days of Ramadan is sunnah mu'akkada to make i'tikaf. This is also a sunnah kifaya, meaning there has to be at least one man in the community who is doing this in the masjid. If no one is doing it, the entire community is blameworthy. And if it happens over and over again, the entire community is sinful. At least one, that's why you should thank the man who's making i'tikaf. Thank him for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he's taking this responsibility from the entire community. Okay? It's a common obligation. Let's say that you try to do this. There's a group of you. And after five days, you're like, you know, I'm out of here can't do it, then you don't have the reward of the sunnah. Your etikaf is nafila. Everyone else will fulfill the sunnah mu'akkada. And that's the third type. The third type is that which is recommended by any other time of the year. Um, and he says here, it's mustahab, it's nafila. And the time duration for this is any, any amount of time, at any time. Even if he says you walk through the, mus through the masjid for one minute, before you go into the masjid, have an intention of i'tikaf. Every single time you go to the masjid, 
We should have that opinion, uh, att intention. Every single time you go to the masjid, have an, opinion, have an, uh, an intention. No way to i'tikaf ma dumtu fil masjid. I intend i'tikaf as long as I'm in the masjid. And this is nafila. So you get the reward of going to the masjid, you know, praying in congregation and the i'tikaf. It depends on what your intentions are. Right? But the only type of i'tikaf in which fasting is a condition is the first type, the wajib type, where you make an oath. Okay. When is it and when is it not permitted to exit the masjid? In the i'tikaf. You can leave the masjid if you have a legal need, such as Friday prayer. They don't pray Jum'ah in that masjid that you're in. Even though it's a congregational masjid, you can leave the masjid, go to the masjid, pray Jum'ah, come back. Or you have to uh, answer the call of nature. Uh, or if the masjid is going to collapse, you can leave the masjid. Right? If you're being oppressed by an oppressor, coerced by an oppressor, like a tyrant says, leave the masjid, we're going to kill your family, you leave the masjid. If you fear a rebel or a thief that's going to come into the masjid, kill you, steal from you, you can leave the masjid. Um, if one exits the masjid for any duration of time without a valid excuse, the sunnah or wajib i'tikaf becomes nafila. So if you take an oath, if you took an oath, Ya Allah, if you give me a son, I'll make i'tikaf, you have to do it one day with a fast. Halfway through, if you leave, that was good. You did a nafila, but you have to go back and do another day because you haven't fulfilled your oath. <clears throat> Allah met his condition, but you have not. And obviously, you're permitted to eat and drink and sleep in the masjid, in the musalla area. That's what they're talking about. <clears throat> Should you have a dream and a night emission, uh, then um, you wake up, obviously, you go, you leave, you make ghusl, and come immediately back, and your etikab is intact. There is no contact with your wife at all. Zero contact, and it spoils your etikab. <clears throat> it is makru to keep silent for a re reason, uh, for, the, for a reason which you believe there is thawab in doing so. So the previous Ummah, part of their etikaf was not speaking, a vow of silence. This has been abrogated in our Sharia. You can stay silent in etikaf because you're contemplating things or because you just don't feel like talking, right? But if you're doing it as an act of worship, this is a bid'ah and it's makru to do that, right? So for example, you're in the masjid, you're making etikaf, and somebody comes and says, Salaamu Alaikum, and you don't say, Wa Alaikum as because you want to take a vow of silence. This is makru. It's actually wajib for you to return the salam. One is to engage in beneficial discussion and learning. What is haram during i'tikaf? Any contact. Any type of contact with your wife during i'tikaf is haram. Okay? I basically, you know, we covered all of what I wanted to really cover. There's much more detail in the text. There's six kutub in the text. You should get the text, by the way. This is chapter four. We'll take some questions now, and then we'll end the show. Yes, sir. As to the uh, cap, what I uh, like to say, take this uh, premises. What 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 is considered to be the uh, proper place for you to stay the uh, the, the, the whole time? Is the musalla area. Okay, the so musalla. This room would not qualify. This room does not qualify, yeah. It's the place where the five prayers are conducted. So in the musalla area. Now you can leave the musalla again if you have a hajat shari'ah, if you have a, a legal need. You have to use the bathroom or you need to get food very quickly, come back and eat in the musalla, sleep in the musalla, study in the musalla. Right? Everything is done in the musalla area. Um, yeah, but this, you know, this room would not qualify. You know, you can't just sit in here and turn on the TV. And... I'm in here to <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, 
And, you know, sometimes a lot of youth, they, you know, it's good they make etikaf, but they do things that are completely haram in the etikaf. When we were in, jun you know, junior college guys, 18 years old, we made etikaf in a masjid one time, you know, we're playing cards and telling jokes. And I remember this, this older man came in for fudger prayer and he saw us playing cards and he almost lost his mind. And like, what, what do we do? What, what? We're making etikaf. So we, we got an earful that day. <laughs> <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, can you qualify or elaborate like, in context of why you didn't make a cut? What's that? So, like, can you elaborate on like uh, in context with, with why you put it? Like, what kind of contact now? Is it like cell phone or anything? Like no, 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 any, any physical contact. Oh. Touching, kissing, fondling, anything like that. Even touching uh, is, is considered haram in a Hanafi school. Yeah, you can communicate with your wife. You can see your wife, Emma, so on and so forth. That's, that's permissible, calling her. Uh, but any type of physical contact is impermissible in etiquette. It immediately ruins your etiquette. This is a time of total seclusion. Right? The second type is mentioned in the smoke of that. It's the 10 days of the last 10 days of the month. Yes. So, so, yeah, some security issue or something. Yeah, so, so in, uh, in Alam here, we'll probably say something like, well, since this is not Darul Salam, it's not Darul Islam, and we have to abide by the laws of the country, if that's what's preventing it, if there's some sort of ordinance or something like that, uh, some law in this county or something that prevents someone from sleeping overnight in a public building or something, something, I don't know what it is, something like that, then inshallah ta'ala, that's, that's okay, we abide by the law, we don't break the law of the land that we live in, right? Um, but if it's something sort of just internally within the masjid, then obviously they should allow the atikaf to do that. It's sunnah, sunnah kifai, not far kifai, sunnah kifai. In the sense that if no one's doing it, the entire community is blamed, but it's not necessarily sinful. If it was fortified, then it would be sinful upon everybody. Right. Actually, we have done over the weekend, we <coughs> raised three days, but I think last year there was maybe a group of, a uh, couple of uh, youngsters who stayed here for all the 10 days. I'm not really sure. Yeah. But, you know, I think uh, now that we have established community, um, probably we should consider uh, doing it. Is it possible to do it in I mean, a group of people, uh, two days, two days divided. Uh, no. No? No. In order for the Sunnah Kifaya to be lifted, at least one man has to do it for all ten all nights. Days. At least one man. Yeah, you can't take shifts. It's good to start as a group, and usually it dwindles. Most people actually leave after the first night. No, this is not for me. So if there's 20 people, by, by night two, there's about four. Right? Uh, because you know it's 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 it is so, somewhat difficult. You have to really focus and jump into it. Yeah. For the logic of the uh -huh. can you do the twenty-four hours and fast at home the next day? No, you have to stay within the within the musalla within the masjid. So for the twenty-four hours you're there, you have to be fasting. You have to be fasting, yeah. If it's a if it's a wajib, yeah. You have to be in the masjid at least from maghrib to maghrib, twenty-four hours, yeah. Fasting in the masjid. Yeah. So if you don't do the ten nights, the last ten nights, the sunnah becomes a nafila. The sunnah is still outstanding. The sunnah kifaya. That was the ending of the last question. But yeah, you have to fast within the masjid as well. Any other? Yes, sir. During can you go online on your cell phone? If it's for a religious reason. Right. Let's say that you want to go to you want to go to a website where 
you can read the Quran or something or read Tafasir or something like that, yeah, no problem. You can do that. But if it's, you know, doing things like checking Facebook and things like that, the ulama would say that that's makru to do that. It's makru. It doesn't spoil the etikaf, but it's makru to do that. How yeah. about uh, he mentions that if one is in need for his family, then he can actually conduct business during etikaf. If there's a need, like his family is, you know, in financial issues, then he can do that. But if there's no need like that, um, if, if it's not a hardship upon the family, then it's prohibited to conduct business during etikaf. So no email. Yeah. yeah. Well, it depends. Yeah. Email for business purposes, they would they would say makru, makru at, at best. Yeah. I think we're out of time. But maybe one more. Here. We're out of time. Yes. So when uh, a brother has uh, attends classes at university for like two days a week, for like four hours, does he go and come back? Uh, no, he cannot leave for that reason. He can't leave for that reason. Someone else should do the etikaf. Yeah. Someone else should do it. Last question? Did you have a question? No? Somebody else? Okay, call us. Zakala Khana, Jazalama Anna Sina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Nahu Ahu. Jazalama Anna Sina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Nahu Ahu. Jazalama Anna Sina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Nahu Ahu. Wa Akhiru Dawan, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen.